بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the Safina Society podcast I'm your host Moeen and we are once again joined by Dr. Shadi Ilyas and Nazmul On this particular episode we are going to be talking about leisure and what it means and the concept in Arabic is called lahu or pastime So I was reading an article. Uh, in 1492, there was a scholar named uh, Ibn Abdul Hadi, and he had this urge to finish this library. So he had tons and tons of books, and he started a social reading event. So he would read his books out loud, mm-hmm. aloud with his family members. So that included his sons, his daughters, wives, and also anybody else that wanted to join. Mm. So they would actually take meticulous notes about when they started, when they finished, what books they read, who was actually reading the last time, and then they would continue it. And what actually happened is they went on to to such a degree that they would actually finish like two or three books per day. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting things I found about this piece was that the people attending the reading somehow found this fun. They found this enjoyable, and it was a type of leisure. And so if we talked about this today, most people would find this boring. And clearly our conception of entertainment or lahu has evolved over time. So my question to everyone here is, you know, what do we make of today's globalistic monocultural entertainment sort of machine? For example, every kid in the world is hip to most American pop culture, right? Most people know who Spider-Man is, who Superman is. Uh, whereas a kid in the past in you know rural India, for example, may have grown up listening to the legends of Amir Hamza and Babur. Uh, <laughs> Whereas today, the same kid knows about Peter Parker and his uncle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what should Muslims make of this globalized sort of lahu machine? And, you know, no (coughs) doubt we as human beings require leisure time to unwind. Uh, There's a hadith by the Prophet ﷺ. He said, recreate your hearts hour after hour for the tired hearts go blind. Mm -hmm. So if we are to oppose the this this entertainment engine, as I spoke about, what should be our lahu? You know, what are the parameters in our Sharia to have wholesome entertainment and a pastime? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Well, first thing is that it's going to be really hard to pass any judgment on uh, such a massive enterprise, such as you know the world, the global worldwide entertainment. Well, global, global and worldwide are synonyms, but uh, global uh, uni culture, monoculture, I should say, uh, entertainment, and that's really what it is. But um, as a side point, there is a wisdom behind monoculture because if we are in Akhir Zaman, we actually believe that there's going to be one leadership in Akhir Zaman, mm-hmm. one villain in Akhir Zaman, and one religion in Akhir Zaman. Mm-hmm. So it would, do, would require a unification of taste, of mm-hmm. entertainment even, of humor even, right? A unification of everything is what's going on. So I find it would be hard to just, just uh, pass a commentary here or there, but I do think the bulk of the uh, monoculture's entertainment is is uh, negative and not fitting into our sharia while at the same time you all, we are living in this world you can't avoid certain things and when we do go for entertainment we're going to be choosing from something within this monoculture right and we can't just say it's all we throw the whole thing out you're going to end up with an extreme because as you cited in the hadith people do need a type of entertainment it's, it's sort of necessary to have a, uh, something to unwind with. So you're going to have to just be selective, right? Okay, the ideal is why don't the Muslims make their own thing? All right, well, they'll try. But you could take something that's completely secular, right? And you could couch it in an environment that uh, becomes an environment that's actually good, right? Like, I've never actually been a football fan, for example. But some of my friends were. And they're, you know, the, the families are friends, et cetera. And we get invited to some of these football games. But these football games, you're, you're sitting there watching the game, but the suhbah around you is actually still positive. You're, pr- you're, pl- you're, you're praying salah. You're, the, you know, the children there are getting together, you know, positive reinforcement of certain things. The families are getting together. So you're going to have to borrow and take, you know, from this model culture of entertainment, what you can, and uh, couch it in an environment that that removes any of the negativity. And I think I found in general that sports, you know, not just watching them, but even being involved in sports has always been a wholesome activity. Something I was talking about with a friend is when I was younger, I was on a base. I was on baseball team, right? So I found 
playing baseball was a great activity, not just for entertainment, but I also found it as a great team building exercise versus other sports. For example, I'll give you, I know I, I was involved in, in baseball, soccer, tennis. I played a number of different sports. Baseball was very different in, in how it kind of built you up versus how something like soccer would. Uh, soccer, I found, was a, a, was a, you know, at least where, in, on my team, it was a very glory-hungry sport, right? You, you hand the ball to the Brazilian kid who scored, mm -hmm. right? Or you handed it to the Turkish kid, you know, who was, who was the striker, and he kind of did his thing. Whereas in baseball, it was a very communal-type sport. If you were the guy at bat, you had to, you know, the whole team had to make sure that you succeeded, otherwise you weren't going yeah. to... You know, it, it, the whole team was going to fail. So it's I actually, would, yeah, sorry, go ahead. And, and, I, and I noticed even at practice, you know, even the kids that were bullied outside on, t on the team, in, in baseball at least, it was a very communal, wholesome sort of activity where everybody was involved. Yeah, it's a semi-individual team sport. That's what baseball is. It's a semi-individual team sport. Soccer, not necessarily. It's, it is, it's a team sport, but yeah. – uh, not everyone does get a chance to touch it's the ball. That's true, right. right? That's the reason, yeah. And some people, you don't want them to touch the ball, right? <laughs> it's actually a negative if you think about it. Right? Well, I mean, base, baseball is like that too. That's why you have things like pinch hitters, yeah. pinch runners. Yeah. It's, I hate to say it, but it's kind of a loser's game, man. <laughs> base, base, baseball is like cricket. It's like, come on, man. American cricket. I mean, you could be, the thing about... Uh, Forget that. Actually, to be honest, I think all these team sports are, they're fine, but I don't, I don't support any of it. Why, why is that? I don't think that any of these, I don't think that any of these team sports are necessarily, uh, I don't think that they actually build any long-term benefits for someone who is looking to be a successful individual. I mean, if you're the quarterback on a football team, maybe, but even then. No, but every team sport, though, anything you do. If there's a challenge to it, you're going to have to dig deep and you're going to have to develop something. And once you develop it, you just happen to develop it there. It was forced to come out there. But now that it's out, it's out for everything. So let's look at let's look at what people who are influential in the world actually do for sports. Almost all individual. Mm -hmm. And none of it involves a team. None of it involves chasing a ball around. It's all about your individual skills that you developed. And these are these is like, I'm talking about people that are very influential in the world. So like royalty, you know, captains of industry, truly great, successful people. They fence, they swim, mm. they, uh, they ride horses. I mean, they do, they do the things that we were already told in the sunnah mm. are the things to do. But, but that stuff, it's, it's boring in comparison to team sports. Not if you're good at it. Yeah, but even still, okay, you're you you have no group feeling. There's no sense of camaraderie. There's no even need for deep strategies, right? Where you're relying upon multiple people to do the to do one thing, right? That to me is funner and more impressive, and it builds like it builds bonds. Now this is where the point of laib and lahu are different. So lahu is defined as amanun leisa lahu. Which mm -hmm. is an act that has no value, neither in itself, nor to something else. Like we all got together and rolled dice and see who got more, right? So there's no value in itself, nor uh, in anything else, uh, or secondary. But al is something that in itself is nothing, but it does lead to something else, right? And if you look at most of these sports, they're just excuses for people to do things together. Like you're exercising together, you might learn a couple things about adversity, yeah. winning, losing, and so, it's a reason for people to get together. So what these people that I'm talking, these type of people, you know what they do together? They row, rowing. But that's a that's a but, totally team sport. Yeah, yeah. but they, they row. It brings a lot of unity. There's, you know, you, you got the coxswain. <laughs> but how is this fun? Yeah, how is that, how is that fun? How is that fun? So rich people do, man. I don't know. It but looks, rich, it looks rich like people, they're enjoying themselves. But rich, they're rich people. They are mostly inherited their wealth, yeah. right? If you, you know, this is the inherited traditions Long because high. they live on bays and 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 yeah. and, uh, and lakes and stuff mm -hmm. like that, right? Whereas it's, it's a posh sport, right? Like Harvard, Harvard grads. It's not. Like, it's not yeah. even a sport. It's it's rowing. <laughs> let me tell right? you about. <laughs> let me tell you about some serious camaraderie, right? Yeah. So me and uh, Dr. Mahmoud. Yeah. We go shooting together. We're in separate lanes. Yeah. We have on headphones plus sometimes earplugs if we're indoor that are we can't hear each other. 
We're blocked off by the by the shooting lanes. We can't see each other. We go. We arrive in separate cars. We get our our boost next door to each other. We shoot. We compare targets and we leave. And it's it's a lot of camaraderie and a lot of bonding going on there. We don't even talk at all. There's a lot of ways to have bonding. <laughs> but yeah. that, isn't that sort of subjective though? Like what you would consider bonding and what? Um, yeah, I guess. Like might. women would consider bonding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it's. That was uh, a very direct question. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I mean, I, if you want to gossip and talk a lot, yeah, sure. No, but I think uh, I'm I'm personally I find sports is to be what else is had that for you out there, yeah. right? So you know, it's another good thing along these lines. Yeah. Hunting, hunting is great, and again, you barely talk to each other. In fact, you need to be quiet. Yeah, I mean, if you want to be a, like gathering, you can gather berries or whatever, and then you can have a long conversation. But if you if you want to do something that's manly, like going out into the woods and stalking animals. You don't talk at all. Yeah. But it's also very, there's a, there's a strong bond that gets formed. So Alex has a point, actually, uh, because um, when Ivy Leagues actually admit students, one of the criteria that they look for is, is the student engaged in some sort of individualistic sport? Okay. And I'm going to tell you the reasoning before you, uh, uh, before you refute me. Okay. The <laughs> <laughs> so uh, their reasoning is that if you're in an individualistic sport, like horse riding, like... Um, uh, what fencing, right, or something else? You have nobody else to rely on except for your own skill. Okay. So the buck stops with you, basically. Yeah. So this is an indication of your ability to like, basically like to support lead. Your, to lead and to be independent. Okay. So they're looking for those types of students. By the way, one of the things that they probably don't look at is track. Track. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. I wonder yeah. why that is. Yeah. Because it's not in their tradition. And this mm. is, this was the point that I was making is that these things. You look at it, fencing, swimming, horseback riding, right? Um, these are also the things that are named in the hadith about the things that you should teach your children. Archery, shooting, right? Mm. These are these are things that were named in the hadith, and not coincidentally, it's the sports of royalty. Sheikh, Sheikh Ibrahim of Siafa has a whole talk about this, yeah. about futuwa and sports, and he makes the point that the games where you're running around chasing a ball, he said this is lower class stuff, and he doesn't mean it in like, oh, poor people stuff. He means like it's... It's not. It's de classe. It's not something that um, more advanced people would, should be doing. Really, like, this is like for little kids. That's his argument. Yeah, adults well, what should are not the, be engaged what, in that. What's the advanced civilization of the world today doing? <laughs> I mean, they're not the the people, the leaders. They're still doing the same things. Like he was talking about, the heads of states, <clears throat> the people who go to Ivy Leagues, the people that run the banks, that run the corporations, that run the government. They're all still engaging in these individual sports and excelling. I in mean, them. even even golf is a very individual. That's sport. not even, even a golf. Sport. That's, <laughs> that's not a sport. That's <laughs> just like for talking. It's business. a game. Yeah. But yeah. like the sports that they engage in, it's still it's fencing, it's horseback riding. Okay, it's, that might all be true. But when I go for entertainment, I don't want to theorize and be philosophical. I'm going to do what I enjoy. If it's halal, I'm going to join it. Right now, I'm not denying that there could be thought behind it. That fencing. Now, the prophet I said him when he said archery, swimming, mm -hmm. wrestling. There was there there was oh that was, those are the three right yeah. archery swimming uh, and horseback riding and horseback riding yeah. that's the one I missed horseback riding yeah. now why the prophet I said said these because these have real life implications as well mm -hmm. right jihad now when we say baltad okay and, and everything else is baltad well baltad just means that in itself it has no value like there's no value in itself to put a ball in a hoop right, right. that doesn't mean that it's haram mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that there is no benefit there is no secondary benefit right? sure. It could have a secondary benefit. And so the main secondary benefit is that this is a time when I want to shut my brain off, mm. right? So I want to shut my brain off. Like sometimes you're sitting with someone and they're watching a game and they're saying, you know, this is a complete artificial reality. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> that's actually sometimes the point though, because I want to get away from anything real, quote unquote real, mm. right? I want to get away from something like that. Mm. And the, I honestly, the only way that I actually relate to the greater culture and how do we relate to the greater quote if there is such a thing as a greater american culture right to me the only thing i relate is the stuff that the sports that i did when i was young like that what are the, where is us the point of contact i don't have a grandparent that was from here for example to have memories or whatever right, right. um cuisine not really we still eat our own our own food right uh what else is there maybe some cuisine what else is there Mm. right to me this is the my main connection mm. so or, if i need to strike up a conversation with a random person what am i going to talk about i don't want to talk about politics right. oh yeah yeah you watch <laughs> that's i'm going to jump ahead then yeah really quickly 
I uh, I, I do engage in, in forms of... Inter- I, I engage with entertainment, like popular culture entertainment, mostly like movies and television shows. Yeah. And almost without exception, they are for one purpose. Um, I watch stuff with my wife that she wants to watch. I watch stuff that my brother recommends to me because then we'll have a good conversation about that. And I watch stuff that... Um, some people, I, some of the people I work with watch, so that I can also engage with them. It's all, it's all, it's all for a purpose, though. Yeah. Like I, 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 enter, I enjoy it. Like if one of these people recommends something that's completely outside of my wheelhouse, I'm not going to watch it. I'm not going to enjoy it. But if if it's moderately halal or <laughs> less haram than than really haram, <laughs> and uh, one of these groups of people is into it, then I watch it for that purpose. Is what I used to. I used to watch sports too, but I enjoyed it too much. I'm telling you, all this stuff is for that purpose. If you're alone in a stage where you're alone in your life, right? You really don't need pretty much any of these things, right? Yeah. Unless you've developed into a type of balanced person as you are, uh, you know, just as is. But if you're all alone, let's say you're in your last decade of life and you have no connections to anyone, mm. then none of this stuff has any value mm. if you think about it. Or if you're a Sheb and you're studying, you're overseas studying, right? You don't need to do any of these things. You're wasting your time. But once you're actually living connected, like Ibn Atat says, some people are in the Asbab, some people are out of the Asbab. Meaning you're in the world of causes and effect and you're connected to all these things. Then this thing could have multiple functions. I think the problem too, though, is that we're living less. So there was a period when I went to college and it's also the first year that I became Muslim. There's a gap. Um, when when uh, when the guys from Chicago were here from the Mad Mad Luke's, they were talking about... Um, those like CIA pict- movies with Harrison Ford. And I had no idea what any of them were, but I was like, did that come out like around between 92 and 96? Yeah. And they were like, oh yeah, one came out 93, one came yeah. out 95. I said, yeah, that makes sense. That's why I don't know them. Yeah. During that four year period, when I first became Muslim and I was first in college, I had I went to zero television. I listened to the radio almost not at all. Yeah. I didn't go to a single movie in that whole period. And I didn't miss any of it because you're living communally with a bunch of people your age, you're hanging out mm-hmm. and you're studying. And I had just converted to Islam, so I had a lot to read. Mm. So mm. I had, ze- I have zero memory of that yeah. four-year period. Yeah. Mm. And I think uh, one thing that I'd like to go back to that I talked about in the beginning, the first story that I told about the guy uh, who was reading, you know, a number of books to finish his library. What you know, Elias just said about communal living is the entertainment of the past was very communal. Right. Right. It was not so individualistic as it is today. And, you know, the, one of the things that I find really interesting is especially this idea of the, the current anxiety that people have and depression that people have. I find it interesting because, you know, somebody noted to, to me that it may be that it's not that people don't have entertainment, but rather perhaps they're being entertained in the wrong ways, right? They're, they're mm-hmm. not being fulfilled by what they should be fulfilled by. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I totally agree with that. That was at recently with a group of people. And they meet regularly. Uh, and one person said, you know, some people dropped out. And the reason they dropped out was they felt that they were, you know, weren't producing anything in this gathering, right? But then someone brought up a great point that said, does everything have to be production? Like, why don't we just, why don't we value relationships anymore? And there was this thing where uh, uh, the, one of the Native American groups, they used to, you know, I don't know, do some kind of harvesting using some tools. And it would take them all day to do it. Right, and then the Spanish came in and they gave them another tool, like a tool that they could do the work in half the time. So then they do the work in half the time, then go home, and they found them like storytelling, building fires, playing with their kids, singing songs, doing all these things. And the Spanish wrote about them that these people are so lazy. We gave them the tools to to do double the work instead of doing double the work. They just did the same work in half the time and went home. But the question then becomes, what do you value? Do you value some output, some material output that you can touch and, and think about right, or, or contemplate? Or do you value relationships? Mm. And relationships is something where a real sa'ada, happiness of human beings comes in. Mm. And I remember reading a qasida uh, that actually Habib Omar wrote, and he said, uh, all of happiness is in your uncles and all of your happiness is in your friends, right? Mm. That's the height of happiness is when you're with those relationships. And me having been more of a sort of an only child, not really only child, that old, way older sister though, but most of my youth was spent all alone, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't understand this line at all, right? We had no family in America, right? Mm-hmm. No uh, 
no family in America, no siblings, no kids down the road, no big community, like maybe three families maximum. It's a really isolated uh, experience, mm. right? So I never even understood that until actually developing later. Now you have connections, you have family and stuff. But but to Alex's point, I was act, uh, in, in the same situation. I had no need for any of these things. Very few connections in terms of friends and family. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was all study, study, study. When I came back, it was around 2006, 2007. And I had uh, no clue about any of the side conversations that people were having. Mm-hmm. But we're here to do Dao, right? So I'm going giving talks here and there. And I'm thinking, I have no clue what these people are saying, right? There's not even any glue in the relationship. So I viewed it as there's no glue in this relationship. There's nothing connecting me with these individuals. Right. So then I had to sort of artificially get to know stuff mm. and that's why i said this laib is something that has no point in itself but has a secondary purpose mm. right so that's really what you have to think about when you're engaging in these things you got to think about the secondary purpose and <clears throat> what i'm hearing is that um laib itself doesn't contain any value and um uh, unless it's leading to something else right so is this can you say that at a certain point in your life, it's ideal that there's no life and you're just spending all your time, you know, worshiping Allah and doing all that? Because uh, Allah actually uses the word lahu in a negative sense in the Quran. Right? Let me tell you what the the ideal is. The mm. ideal is where Allah puts you. Mm. If Allah Sa'ala puts a person in jail for the last 10 years of his life, then that's what's best for him, right? Mm. If he puts him in isolation and solitary uh, or a solitary life in general, then that's what's best for him. If he put him in the middle of everything until the last moment of his life, he's living like a regular Muslim and he's engaging in all these, uh, you know, secondary things just to glue together the family and the community, then that's what's best for him. So there is, our ideal is individualized. It's what Allah chose for that person Mm. at that time, Mm. right? So you have that. You have people who grow old and they stay in their family or in their community and until the end of their lives, they're in what Ibn Atta said, the world of Asbab, the world of interactions, causes and effects, right? Uh, if that's what Allah chose for them, then that's what's best. Mm-hmm. If Allah pulls them out of that and causes them to be alone, then that's what's best for them. And they could, and if, if they're all alone and they don't take advantage of that to do their, to advance spiritually, then they're wasting their time. And, and you know, one of the uh, crazy things is that uh, Muin mentioned that depression is on the rise. Today's lahu, people are engaging in it more and more to an unhealthy degree because of their depression. It's like um, it's almost like a cyclical, it's a, almost like a cyclical pattern, right? So in that sense, um, can we say that uh, is there too much lahu being engaged in? And should we cut, uh, cut it down? I think it's become the dhikr of it's the dhikr of shaitan. By the mm. way, lahu, right? And it's all they do. It's like I I can get into something for like. 25 minutes 30 minutes maybe like an evening right mm. but i can't imagine the people whose careers it is like like i i'm a ba- i consider myself someone who loves sports but i can't do this more than like an hour mm. for like in a week or something like i can't it's a massive waste of time i can't imagine mm. someone whose career whose earnings is in this field you never cross your mind how meaningless this is <laughs> yeah well exactly i remember and <laughs> There was a time there where I used to listen to sports radio. That's why I used to listen yeah. to my commute. And sometimes I have like an hour and a half commute. Yeah. That's three hours a day. Yeah. Five days a week. That's 15 hours a week of listening to yeah. some idiots who know every statistic <laughs> ever about every sport that's ever <laughs> I, I find it interesting. And there was an essay by uh, Hilmi Ibrahim in, in which she talked about leisure and Islam. So one quote that I found interesting is that she defined leisure as you know she looked upon leisure in the following trifaceted fashion a state of mind which allows one to participate in certain forms of human activities these include contemplation relaxation diversion and socialization which usually take place in that block of time remaining beyond that which is needed for existence and subsistence Mm -hmm. i find this really interesting because even the definition of leisure you know classically is not watching netflix no for you know hours and hours of time nope. you know sitting <laughs> sitting in a dark room by yourself watching a movie for five hours is not leisure yeah, it's not that normal is, that's it's not, not normal. E- that's not even normal no. and this is actually the reason i feel that people 
are depressed and people mm-hmm. do have this in, this constant addiction to these stimuli like streaming Netflix or you know watching cat videos and you know, prank videos on, on YouTube. Oh, yeah, at least that's not allowed. <laughs> <I'm guilty. laughs> so the um, you know my wife will testify to this. The thing that I do the most in terms of want something that's productive but outside of like work necessary stuff is work do something with my hands mm-hmm. even if it's something menial like cleaning something or uh you know fixing something but even better if it's something that where i'm like putting something together or whatever it is that i'm doing like i'm working on my tools or whatever um i'll put on something that's intellectually stimulating um oftentimes it'll be like a legal podcast or you know oral arguments or something like that i'll listen to that while i do something where i can just don't really have to think about the tasks that I'm engaging mm. in, but it's active. It's physically active. Like I'm moving around and I'm using my hands and I'm building something or I'm fixing something. This is the most relaxing thing that you can do mm. for me. It's mm. and it's not zoning out in front of a video game. Since we're on uh, the topic of definitions, so let's look at this uh, Quranic definitions and Quranic usage of uh, of these words. Yeah. Now leisure diff- is something different, but we do have Allahu wallaib was summer musamara. Okay, so these are three different terms. Two are tend to be are you one is used always negatively, one is used with permissibility and negative, and the third is used in pos- in a positive light. So you have a gradation there. So Allahu Allah always come together in the Quran, and mostly except for two surahs, Laib comes first. Laibun wa lahun, right? Now Allahu we already said it's that which has no value in itself nor secondary value. Uh, but there's another definition for it. And the reason that they had to separate the definitions is whenever you have something repeated in the Quran, it's it, in the Quran specifically, there has to be a difference in the meaning. Because from balagha or eloquence is that you don't repeat something. So therefore the repetition in, in Arabic, you can have repetition for tawkid, just a synonym to emphasize it. Mm-hmm. Or you can have repetition for ta'sis, which is to give you a different meaning. So lahu and lab have to have two different meanings. Now, the reason that lahu is always uh, connoted in the negative is it's that which has no value self or, or, or otherwise. And secondly, it's considered that which uh, the intelligent person is distracted by it from what benefits him. All right? So lahu is always given the connotation that uh, the adult, intelligent person uh, engaging in this, right, it's now taking him away from what he's supposed to be doing or what benefits him. Now, al is used in a permissible sense because the brothers of Yusuf said, let us take him out. Yarta wa yal'ab, right? So yal'ab is there. And Prophet Yaqub permitted it, right? He said, okay, go with them, right? So therefore, la'ib can be permissible. So a la'ib, they say that it's la'ib and lahu are, could be the same thing, but lahu is bad because it's an adult and la'ib is for children. And children are mukallaf anyway, so they could engage in it and there's no harm. The other definition is that la'ib does possess a la'ib like uh, playing a sport. It has nothing in itself, but in a secondary cause can have a benefit. Do you have a comment? Yeah. So I, it just occurred to me one other thing about those mm-hmm. those type of sports where it's like the team sports like basketball and football and soccer. Those are actually not good for your body. Like people think that they're getting a good workout. You're not. And you're actually more than likely causing yourself long-term damage. Like on the knees? Like on the knees, on the joints, there's contact that's that's pointless. And you're harming your body in a way for something that has virtually no benefit and may even be a waste of time. And you're causing yourself harm. Most people that play organized team sports end up with injuries that affect them lifelong, yeah. even in their ability to like pray standing up. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty... He's right about that. I mean, a lot of you know, professional sports as, as well with with team sports they, they tend to, to have a lot of injuries even mm-hmm. for regular like standard just you know street basketball players you know yeah. it's, it's very common to be injurious right knee pr- knees people can't play I mean, properly it happens yeah. all the time we have friends up in in uh, in our community who play in, like intramural sports all of them have injuries wow like all of them and you, the people we know from the masjid all those guys that play basketball that are ab- older than 30 yeah. They're always getting hurt. But that's maybe the, one of the secondary benefits then. Mm-hmm. Because the doctor, the doctor industry, the <laughs> medical industry needs it. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I don't want to be a contrarian here, yeah. but when you're riding a horse, you could die, right? You could uh, fall off horse. You could fall off a horse right? and yeah. break your neck. So interestingly, one of the things that Ivy Leagues look for if a person's doing horseback riding is 
they're willing to risk their life to learn this, right? Yeah. So, so what's the what's the maybe, prevalence? I mean, but still, there's a risk, though, right? But sure, if there's a risk wrong. of everything, but it's not very prevalent as opposed to the prevalence of of like chronic injury and chronic uh, mm. uh, pain suffered mm. by everyone that plays these sports. But there's still benefit in playing team sports okay. without doing it professionally. You know, you, you don't have to. Uh, yeah, there is. I don't know if it outweighs the the the, the harm in it though. Yeah. Uh, so it's a judgment call. Yeah. Who am I to judge? I mean, I mean, ninety nine percent of people who play professional play sports are not professionals mm. and the bulk of them the injuries are going to be minor in comparison yeah. to the benefits and exactly. the, the fun that they had or the exercise that they right. had exactly. but secondly like the ivy league uh entrance exams or whatever entrance standards i could care less about i these people are a bunch of snobs i hate them anyway was alex just not picked on teams or something that? i played so i played soccer <laughs> as a kid growing up i played i played soccer on like a club team um, I'm thinking he was just not picked for so, a team or something. And no, no, no. I played a lot of team sports as a kid, but uh, I actually preferred stuff like boxing and, and martial arts. That was mm-hmm. what I would have preferred to, to do. Um, in fact, I, I joined the boxing club and didn't tell my mom, and I baked her signature <laughs> on it because she would have never signed off on it mm-hmm. until I came home once with some marks on my face, and she was like, what's going on? <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, there is nothing, in my from my perspective, there's nothing better than building camaraderie. Look, when you go out to battle, you're not doing an individual sport here. This is a team. Exactly. You're operating as a team. I'm telling you, one of the things, if I didn't have, uh, you know, if it was in another life or something, that uh, anything involved in team sports, the camaraderie you build to up, to, to go together as a cha- uh, and and each one of you has a different quality. Mm-hmm. But there was someone who was able to pull this all together yeah. and amplify it to defeat an opponent. One of my other, you know, there's no feeling like that when you actually succeed at doing it. Yeah. And when exactly. one of my favorite things about these sports in general is that they're little uh, judgments of your your effort because there's a scoreboard. Whereas life doesn't have a scoreboard all the time, yeah. which is sort of annoying because you don't really know, am I successful? Am I not? Am I doing it right? You know, so you always need some kind of a scoreboard, some kind of objective number. And right, that's how so that's where little lessons are. Yeah. I, I think what you're saying, I 100% agree with. My only argument is that that is how you train foot soldiers. That is yeah. good practice for the, 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 the privates, the, you know. If you're talking about generals and field marshals, yeah. those guys need to know how to. That's why I said initially, I said, like, if you're a quarterback, cool. Yeah. Because you're leading everyone else and everybody's looking to you. You're yeah. making a decision for yourself and for the team. And your decision is what counts, and you're also the one executing it, right? So it's it's a good leadership. To, but if you're not the quarterback, if you're like the kicker, yeah, or if you're like <laughs> if you're like a lineman, mm-hmm. I mean, well, you're fodder, you're cannon fodder. But here's something else, though. A lot of times in life, people are willful. They're they're independent agents, but need to come together willfully, right? And they could ruin it by everyone going their own way. Right, yeah. like our OMA today is very much in that state. Right. Any community member can just say, you know, tech with this, I'm out of here, right? But if everyone has that attitude, you don't have a community anymore. If you have an attitude of having putting your group first, in the olden days, it may be the tribe first, right? Mm-hmm. Today, what's the analogy that we recognize, right? You put your t- your team first. You take you take a group first attitude. Where do you learn that stuff, right? You're gonna learn that in maybe in school activities you're going to learn that in sports right it'll get amplified there for you in life and you realize wait a second this is a great ethic i should take this to to this situation where mm. i can go my own way if i want to right mm. but there's going to be more benefit and more gain when people come together with different skills and recognize that every skill is needed every uh you know in type of nature or whatever you know personality is needed yeah. yeah, I'll make one point and then we can go back <clears throat> to the definitions. Yeah, I'm, th- on this one, I'm gonna have to disagree with Alex. At, at least on the 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 point of team sports, I think there is massive benefit in in team sports because of how m- there are many life skills that you can gain, especially for younger children, yeah. in team sports. Whether it's courage, whether it's you know even things like bravery, right? rushing down a lane or rushing down something when you know when there's when there's 10 you know big dudes or uh you know people in front of you is is tough right learning to you know, conquer your fears things like that i mean there's a lot of life skills that can be that it's not 
it's not that you can't gain them from other you know individual type sports but i'm not going to downplay you know the value that you can get out of team sports but i don't want to detract from the the topic of you know entertainment throughout throughout the ages as well mm-hmm. okay so let's get to these definitions we said lahu and we said laib right now the third one which always comes in a positive note is a summer or al musamara which is basically that a person spend time usually preferably with his family after salat al isha before sleeping for about an hour or some period of time like the arabs have the word sa'a which is just amount of time a expanse of time a decent expanse of time uh they are with them and they engage in something that is uh, you know n- not necessarily of haq or in, or or of uh seriousness right or even deen right it's just something light so the prophet said said used to recline eat honey and listen to stories that say Aisha would tell like that's one example we have from hadith uh, other sahaba used to do different things so this musamara was the sunnah of the prophet peace be upon him that he never stayed up after isha except for three purposes which was either uh, matters of knowledge that people were seeking or he was giving uh, or matters of the state that said Omar and abu Bakr and uthman and ali that the prophet was engaging with them and discussing with them uh, and musamara kan yusamiru ahla all right and he used to just sit with his family right and do something now today what is a person going to sit with his family to do it's good it's nice when people say okay let's all get together and read books this is nice fine if that's your thing but most people that's not their thing right this is this sounds like a teaching that is very specific and very unique it's nice to get together make a fire and read books because it's so much better it is far better but let's be honest what is mo what are most people going to do they're going to do something that the rest of the world is doing okay so in that if that's the case then there needs to be a discussion on how that's supposed to be done right what are the limits and we know the limits their limits is going to be where there's a muharim there's something forbidden then you're going to avoid it it's a very simple limits right Just now you can monopoly you can even that there's discussion <laughs> even that there's not right there's dice so the madikis mm-hmm. were had some issues with dice right um, these things with pieces and, and, and randomness but I think other madhabs may have some more leniency to that probably wrong huh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. it's interesting this is a, a little side point of history related to this um, in Southeast Asia and also just the East in general uh, people get together and their uh, form of entertainment is watching like series and usually yeah. a TV series, and usually most of these TV series are like super long, over like two hours an episode. Like Whoa. And telenovelas, right? Yeah, yeah, telenovelas. Like and, uh, Erdogan. Yeah, oh, Erdogan. Erdogan. That's, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it is. And, and they have tons of, and this is, this is what's interesting, they have tons of family drama. So it's like always like relationship issues and family dramas, and people are just transfixed by it, right? Um, uh, and while in the United States, when people, families get together, they're watching like, you know game of thrones where somebody's slitting somebody else's throat right so i think the, i think that's an interesting point of contrast i think but those uh telenovelas or muselsalat in arabic yeah. i think they're big time uh drain they're, they're it's excessive right mm-hmm. and they and the shayateen put them in ramadan on purpose mm-hmm. right to uh, pass the time and i even remember my aunts they were they were nice they were they were you know they would they were nice people and everything i love them so much but uh, it's not like saying something negative, right? That they're bad or anything. But after tarawih, <laughs> okay, the food would come out a second time and those shows would come on, mm. right? And I'm like, there's no way I'm watching one of these these shows, oh right? So I'm sitting there because they're all sitting in the room too, mm. right? And actually one of my nieces, she had leukemia. Mm. So we would all, I mean, not my niece, my cousins. So everyone would sit around, right? Try to keep her spirits up and they would put on one of these shows. And we'd eat food, okay, and that's and I was there on vacation anyway, so whatever. And they would stay all the way up to suhoor, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, but there's no way I'm getting into this this ridiculous show, right? It was called The Man and the Other Man, okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm was sitting there. It was Arabic. It was an Arabic show. Oh, right. I'm sitting there, TV shows, right? uh, making sure you know that I'm not watching this stuff, okay? I got my sibha in my hand, trying to do something useful myself in my Ramadan. And then give it, I'm telling you, 20 minutes in. I'm like, <laughs> when's the next episode? <laughs> okay. These things became, if things, this thing became something everyone in the house, 
and our, and the way that old families live and probably I don't know I hope unfortunately this is probably dying out mm-hmm. but their families live all are in the neighbor, same neighborhood yeah. and you don't know who's coming in and out mm-hmm. the door's like basically a public right mm-hmm. everyone's coming in from the cousins and the aunts and the nieces and everyone's coming in and out which is amazing because we don't have this in America but ultimately uh, I got hooked into it and I realized these things it's really excessive mm-hmm. honestly and the only value that it has to it is even if you say that we'll do it together as a family but you're sort of not even together right you're in the same room right mm-hmm. that's maximum pretty much it right mm-hmm. you're in the same room it's not like you're 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 not even looking at each other like around the fire and you're it's not looking. like it's not like it's 45 minutes once a week and oh. then you discuss it yeah. and you you know talk about the themes of all mm-hmm. It's two hours every single night. Yeah. There's no time to talk about oh it. Oh my gosh, yeah. it's horrible. And and you can't talk about it these days too because now before you used to talk about TV shows or books or whatever, right? Now when you want to talk about it, oh, I haven't watched it. Please don't spoil it. Oh, you better not mention a spoiler. So you can't even talk about it. That's right? true. I, so it, it wasn't even that long ago where you you know TV shows came on once a week, and that was sort of the the water cooler talk right mm-hmm. right you, you watch yeah. that you watched a tv show and then the next week you talked about it at work and or wherever you were at school or work or whatever and uh and that was a type of activity people had yeah it would be unfathomable 20 years ago to say that you watched an entire season in one night yeah, yeah. <laughs> that it's would be un- well, unfathomable right. yeah. now let's yeah. take this to another direction it's the easy th- the easy way out in this episode is to just throw everything out in the trash mm-hmm. and say in the back in the old days back in the old days yeah. well, what is that going to do for us and the listeners right. it's not going to go in back in time so let's talk about like what do we do now like mm-hmm. what is what's going on so we're going to give our people an episode of just trashing everything that they know in the world. Right. How have we benefited anything, right? right? So okay. how do people get entertainment, right? How do people relax and unwind themselves? Yeah. I, have, I have a great answer. So still to this day, learn, um, especially if you have children, teach them some kind of combat sport. Was wrestling in the sunnah? Mm. It's updated. It's, MMA is probably more useful today, right? It's an advancement. Uh, swimming is swimming. Oh, it's swimming. Horseback riding, <laughs> that means getting around, right? Yeah. So you should learn how to drive and you should be a good driver. Like that's a useful skill. Like, and you go, oh, everybody drives. Most people don't drive. Mm-hmm. Most people get around in a car and they're a menace. Yeah. But being a good, useful driver is actually a good and, and important skill. And learning to shoot. Archery is great. Archery is traditional, but it's not very useful. Learn to shoot guns. All right. Give me something in the living room. Mm-hmm. Something you can do in the living room? It's Tuesday. Okay, or let's put it this way. It's Sunday, Monday's off from school. Mm. Everyone's how, home. How many kids do you have? Let's hypothetically two, two and a half. 2.5 Wrestle. Kids. You got rugs? Wrestle. Wrestle. Yeah, play around with each other. Okay. No TV. Mm. Wrestle. Okay, now, and the mom? She should be cooking. <laughs> oh, my <goodness. laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. So, um, I'll, I guess, uh, give a little history. I'm just kidding. I could. Yeah. How, how I used to, um, how I used to entertain myself. So, um, in Bangladesh, I lived there for five years, yeah. and so I went to kindergarten in the United States. So I was basically an American kid, right? Now I go back to Bangladesh for five years, uh, don't connect with anybody there. I have this Game Boy, right, uh, that I can only play with batteries. And I only have two games, only two games. And one was Final Fantasy Tactics Advanced, and the other one was whatever, they're RPGs, tons of stories, right? They're like story RPGs? The role-playing games, okay. so story-driven games. I, for the next five years, I played those two games, right? And I, I always used to watch anime every single Saturday. I used to watch anime, right? And these animes, they, they had like these fantastic worlds, like amazing stories, all that stuff. So there was, so that sort of kept me very entertained. All my friends did it, right? There's something useful in having like entertainment that's like event-based, right? Like for example, next Saturday, the next episode of uh, Full Metal Alchemist is coming out, and everybody in the school is talking about it, right? And then you watch it, and then now you have to you have to wait another week for the other episode to come out. If you didn't watch it, well, everybody's talking about it. And that was still a communal activity. Exactly. exactly. So I, I think that it comes back to what we were saying earlier. Mm-hmm. I think we have to come up with ways of entertainment, like for the example, on that Sunday evening that are communal activities. Mm-hmm. I think one thing that 
I found that that I try to do with my family is things like cooking together, right? Making a meal together, yeah. uh, painting, you know, things that you could do together. And and I think un- unfortunately people don't do these things as much. For example, build something, mm-hmm. right? Uh, learn woodworking, l- l- even things like you know fixing a car. That's an activity. <laughs> Don't take your car to the mechanic. Learn how to fix your car. But wait, I don't know about that. Dr. Shelley's <laughs> laughing, right? Well, life is one of the best things I learned as a kid. Yeah. How to fix cars, how to work on a car, how to use tools. Just generally how to use tools because even if you don't know, even if you haven't done a certain thing, if you know what you're doing, mm. you'll be able to pick up how to do anything that ha- that's handy. I can mm. fix almost anything in my house. That's mm. good. That's a great skill. Yeah. Mm. And that's that was like just hanging out with my dad while he was working on the car. Yeah. yeah. I, <clears throat> when you were talking about these shows and everything, yeah. I'm actually very suspicious about uh, entertainment in general. My attitude towards mm-hmm. yeah. um, in my house, mm-hmm. uh, the types of homes. I'm not saying like that, that's what you do, yeah. but I'm just saying in general, uh, the types of homes where the TV is going on all the time. I think mm-hmm. that's just a big disaster, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the idea that the computer can be accessed for entertainment at all times mm-hmm. by everyone in the house—that's mm-hmm. another one. So I try to really limit it to maybe like. Um, you know, for an adult, maybe like in a little bit in the evening, right? If you do it every evening, that's mm-hmm. fine, right? But a, li- a little bit, the two and three hour episodes, you mm-hmm. can't do these things. It's like yeah. it's too much. An hour, hour maximum, two hours, right? Um, for kids, Saturdays maybe, right? For to to watch something, but for them to see to be entertaining themselves constantly mm-hmm. at this young age. It's best with books. Mm. Books during the week and sports. Get your body moving. Books and sports, right? I I loved books as a kid. Yeah, books and sports and bikes and neighbors and all that stuff during the week. And just because, and there's a reason, illa here, illa, Mm. reason uh, behind it is that just because the whole society is watching stuff and you would be a little bit of a weirdo and unable to relate in, you know, a, a little bit if you had no clue about stuff and just because all the other kids are doing it so then we you know maybe can allow some of that stuff to go on on a saturday if mm-hmm. it's okay if it's like halal right yeah. then they could know i don't know whatever you, these some of these cartoons are right mm-hmm. whatever do they still have cartoons on saturdays it's no it's uh, all on um it's all on uh, streamed mm-hmm. right it's series that are streamed but at least like if they're friends if they have five friends and they say it at least they have a clue what's going on. They don't feel so weird. So this is sort of the demystifies, demystifies what is it? Mystification. Demystification uh, philosophy yeah. regarding that. So I would rather have none of it at all, to be honest with you, yeah. right? But just to demystify it and to be able to relate. Yeah. One thing I'm, I'm thinking about is how did Muslims <clears throat> in the past, you know, whether, and I'm not even talking about, you know, long time in the past, even things like, uh, a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago, spend their time, whether it be in the Muslim world or even, you know, in non-Muslim worlds where Muslim where Muslims live in non-Muslim lands. Because one thing I find interesting is, entertainment has generally been a societal pop, pop culture type phenomenon, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Where if you were living in you know, during during the renaissance you were probably watching the same plays that everybody else was watching Mm -hmm. you were probably doing the same things that everybody else was doing whether you were generally muslim or not muslim and i'm not talking about very religious muslims i'm just talking about just everyday lay person Mm -hmm. now when it comes to today i know we talk about you know don't watch the don't watch movies don't watch this don't watch that at least for me, I feel like there has to be a balance in understanding. That, are we saying don't just use technology? Because I don't think technology is the problem here, right? It's what we're talking about is that the entertainment is not wholesome, right? Is there a way to bridge this gap between like, you know, you can still have the technology. You can still use it to your benefit in some way or another, you know, because it's it's what occurs in today's time. Or is that just the, you know, Nick's technology? No, I have a question first. What is the value of discussing or thinking or knowing what, people in the past did how's that going to benefit us i mean i have an answer what's to the that. value yeah. to it i have an answer to that which because is it, mm. if we if we see um how people that didn't have the sort of addiction machines that we call entertainment today well, that's, what they what they use for leisure then we could say you know maybe that activity has some benefit to it 
right? The, and it's all entertaining one. Number two, it also has some benefit to it. So one of the, um, uh, sorry for interrupting you. One of the interesting uh, things that I've noticed um, with some of this research is that in the non-Muslim world, public entertainment, uh, you know, the masses, uh, serfs, right? Public entertainment tended to be pretty crude. Mm -hmm. So if you read Chaucer, for example, right? The, Chaucer is a very uh, public poet. He's not a poet of the elite. Very vulgar. Uh, vo very vulgar. Uh, if you read Dante, he uses, he's not vulgar, but he uses vulgar Italian. Uh, and his poem is like, you know, very popular with the masses. Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, if you look at some of the, like Shakespeare. the bards. Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Shakespeare yeah. very Shakespeare. body. Very There's bold. a lot of like yeah. sexual situations. There's a lot of double entendre. Yeah, and the bards, right? The bards that would sing in the in the pubs and things Troubadours. like that. So regular people engaged in the sort of amoral sort of you know letting their desires all out in this sort of feast of you know haram, right? Yeah. So like Greeks had Dionysian um, orgies and things like that, uh, whatever, right? I mean, they're yeah. no example of anything. <laughs> yeah, they're no example of anything. Uh, if you look in the Muslim world, what's crazy is that public entertainment tended to always center around some type of religious thing. Now right? you're now you're talking some sense because yeah. now you're giving me some something to go by. Exactly. All all before that mm -hmm. was like, okay, I don't care about what they did. I'm not overthinking right, this. Right. I'm telling you my honest attitude. Yeah, yeah. I'm very blue collar about these mm -hmm. things. I'm not overthinking this stuff. Exactly. I spent all my time thinking about avoiding a couple of haram things and drawing near to Allah to add it the best mm -hmm. way I can. Right. I don't like to overthink things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but now this point that you're making, this makes a lot of sense because yeah. the Muslims used to entertain themselves with matter, with types of entertainment that were actually dhikrullah. Exactly. Right. And that exactly. benefits and it relaxes too. Yeah. And ma for example, huge maulids, yeah. huge maulids. Now when, in the Ottoman Empire, when the maulid would happen, it was like a national event. Uh, trucks of sweets with, you know, fireworks. I mean, it's crazy. It's like the Super Bowl. They brought so, together <laughs> relaxation. <laughs> right. And they exactly. made it not only halal, but you get rewarded for it because exactly. you come away from it loving the Prophet, loving right. the Sahaba, mm. right? Doing, uh, uh, bringing up, you know, virtues mm. that people should have, akhlaq that people should have, reminding yourself of akhirah in the middle of this entertainment. So mm. they sort of merged the two together. Exactly. Yeah. The yeah. popular entertainment also, especially in like in the medieval period, was also very sacrilegious. Mm -hmm. Some of it was r religiously oriented, yeah. like. In, in non-Muslim non -Muslim land. In non-Muslim yeah. land. But a lot of it was sacrilegious, was sacrilegious right. and making fun of, if not Allah, mm -hmm. not their conception of God, at least yeah. the church. Now, I want to word this carefully. So we wouldn't say merging entertainment with dhikrullah, mm -hmm. right? But merging something relaxing and enjoyable mm -hmm. with dhikrullah. Like a nice qasida mm -hmm. or song exactly. or poem that's recited in a song-like fashion. Mm -hmm. Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Shaghuri in his, the biography written about him Okay, uh, wa was said that he was to take these poems and he would take the melodies that people listen to now and he would put the qasida to the melody, mm -hmm. to that popular melody. That melody is already in people's head anyway, right? And the melody is like neutral, right? There's right. nothing uh, about... Uh, so he would do that. So he would merge what people already enjoy with a good meaning and even reward because if the qasida has in it, you know, dhikrullah, maybe even a dua mm -hmm. mentioned in it, Right, you're getting rewarded. If it's a virtue of the Prophet or a Sahabi or a Sheikh, even, right, you're cementing a virtue in I, people's hearts. I would just argue one thing to that: that the the, the Arabic melodies mm -hmm. are more different than what you get in the West. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, right. Yeah. So there's actually a science to this. There's a there's a science of maqamat okay. in Arabic, yeah. right? But there's also people study like uh, I, I took a few classes when I was in college about uh, musicology and. Different cultures have different music, different intonations, and it actually inspires different feelings. It in does. You. It totally so does. You, I would not recommend people to do this with Western music because mm -hmm. Western music is based on a completely different uh, pattern, mm -hmm. very different uh, time signature, mm -hmm. and it may not be good for your soul in the way that some of the Eastern uh, patterns are. Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, though, the Eastern patterns, they were established by a man named, uh, uh, what was his name? With a, sure. a Zayn. Uh, Ziryab. Ziryab. Ziryab was a, he's a Persian mm. or he's living in Baghdad. Had to be a Persian. <laughs> he was Figures. a Persian living in Baghdad. <laughs> and he was the first person amongst the Muslims to do things like, well, in the fall, wear this color, right? Mm -hmm. In the winter, wear whites. In the fall, stop wearing whites, right? Because the leaves are changing 
and you want your your clothes to be like off whites, browns, yeah. mm-hmm. all those things. He was the first now, and he also was the establisher of maqams. He thought mm-hmm. about singing songs like this and that. So what did the shiuch of Baghdad, the elders did? They expelled him out of the city. They they kicked him out of the city. It's a corruption of the youth, right? So he ended up going where? Andalusia. Uh, of course, he was welcomed there with open arms, right? right. And that's where Andalusia actually got their famous maqams mm. started. Of course, not. there's not like a direct lineage, but he's the one who I came up with the idea so, of well, these maqams. If you listen to flamenco music today, which is the music of Andalusia, mm-hmm. of like the non-Muslims today, yeah. it's 100% Arabic maqamat. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but but the uh, the 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 concept being that uh, I believe that when we do our, uh, our gatherings, right, and we sing these qasidas, it just it infuses community life with something soft, but also connected to the mm-hmm. deen yeah. at the same time. And oftentimes, it gets in people's heads, right? It's something that stays with them. And if it's missing from a religious life, you cannot have a religious life without festivities. And not just like a party once a year, but it has to be something linked with the sacred. And that's what these mm-hmm. gatherings are it, all about. It brings religion to the public square right? yeah. rather than being just a set of rules you follow yeah, privately. Exactly. I've, I've seen this. Exactly. Before, yeah. before we go off on, on on this road that we're going, I just wanted to co- walk back a little bit and just say that technology, it's not just the content. It's also the technology itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nas mentioned it's addictive. He called it addiction machines. The TV screen, the computer screen, the phone screen, they have addictive yeah, properties. Totally. The content also, even if the content seems neutral, like, oh, it's just like animals being friendly to each other. The way that the colors move, the quick cuts between the scenes, all of that also creates an addictive quality for children's brains especially, and also can alter the way that their brains develop. So all of that, just because you go, oh, it's just a giraffe talking to an <clears throat> elephant and they're just being friends, that's not true at all. Yeah. By the By the way for folks that don't know since we were talking about you know binge shows you know that's actually why they're called black mirrors right and the show black mirror is based yeah. on that because the 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 screen that you're looking at right like for example the tv screen there or, or a phone screen when it's when it's off it's right. actually a mirror right it's a black mirror right and it's, it's it's almost as if you're you're looking at nothing who mm-hmm. calls them black mirrors so there is a very popular show called black Mirror. it's a, it's dystopian, a, it's te- a dystopian it's about technology in the very near future and yeah. its effects on society yeah, yeah. so yeah. And the show is called black mirror a lot of people don't know where the name yeah. comes yeah. from that's it's what the name is about mm. yeah. uh, so it, it, it's telling that that's actually what the name is about and, and, and it's uh it's it, super it's showing, accurate. Like, and, it's and showing a very dark representation of what this technology yeah, is. it's very accurate like just two years after the first episodes that stuff is already being you know yeah. thought about so, and, and, and implemented so yeah. the reason i brought up um you know me watching anime way back when and playing these two games for five years right on the same game boy is because my options were so limited and you know i finished all the harry potter books there right um because <laughs> <laughs> because my options were so limited i was forced in my free time when i didn't have anything to do to sort of build out the world that I was engaging in in my head, this fantasy world. And I feel like that was a big reason why, you know, I developed an, an imagination, right? Because, look, you had, I watched, let's say, episode of Full Metal Alchemist. And then that's it. You had to wait yeah. for an entire week, yeah. right? You couldn't just binge watch the 50 episodes uh, in, in a night, in, in, you yeah. know? There's no time for thought. There's no time for re- reflection. Nothing. That brings up the topic of, uh, you know, when something is lost and something else is gained. Exactly. But yeah. back to the issue of technology, there are certain mediums that a Muslim cannot compete in. Mm. You can't compete in, and you shouldn't try to compete in. Uh, the screen, right? Uh, it's really hard to compete, you know, and keep all of your 100% Sharia, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know. Right. You know, for example, we watch, you could, let's say, Ertaro, right? Mm. You're watching it, you're like rooting on your Muslim hero, et cetera. But at the same time, right, if you think about it, like you wouldn't be having your, your you wouldn't want your Muslim, you or your daughter acting in a movie like that, right? Or in a show like that. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's, so there is some issues there, right? Mm-hmm. So um, even the best of the things that the possibilities are still going to, you're not going to have uh, a show mm-hmm. with, there, with, with no music, no women. There, there's no such thing, yeah. right? It's like yeah. baseball without a bat and a uh, ball right, right. and i'm not saying like no women like uh in a in a, in a sense like we, there gets to be eliminated but in our religion you should not be put up in a, a situation where everyone's staring at you unless you're doing something for a need right, right? like a a doctor a teacher or something 
to just to go up there and, and sing a song or just run around or do something, you know, like that is not something from the akhlaq. Go ask any pious Muslim in the masajid, their moms, would you want your daughter doing that? They're going to say no. So, so no one should take that as, oh, you want to isolate women. No. It would be the same thing for men. I mean, you seriously, you're going to play make-believe as a career, <laughs> right? So right. certain things, the screen, the big screen, is not a medium in which we're going to compete. Yeah. The, the uh, literature, mm. yeah, we can that compete in that, right? Yeah, but unfortunately, nobody reads these days, right? But, but, so, no. Two things I want to say. One is I've always found it interesting that even in in the past when there used to be, so like you mentioned, Azmul, certain forms of entertainment, such as the big maulids, Jumu'ah, uh, you know, Jumu'ah is a festival, right? It, uh, uh, just, to, yeah, just to clarify that point, that Jumu'ah oftentimes was this, all the things that would happen after Juma. So, yeah, in, for example, in Egypt, it's a big t- thing to go and have a large family, mm-hmm. extended family mm-hmm. meal, for example. Yeah, Yeah. so Juma, Reed, and even things like, you know, stories that were orally told, stories, for example, mm-hmm. that were told around a campfire mm-hmm. or, you know, just people sitting around. I know even in my village, you know, where when I was younger, I still remember this, people would sit around and there was a guy who just literally told stories. Yeah. There was the guy. Right, and you went to him and he just happened to know long narrations mm-hmm. that would go on for two hours and he could tell you this story. And every night people would sit and this guy would tell you, this wasn't even that long ago, yeah. right? This is when I was a kid. So I find it you know, very interesting that uh, one, one, and the second point I wanted to make is on top of all of these things that existed in the Muslim tradition, one thing I've always found very interesting about music uh, is even though that musicians were considered like, Fasics and they weren't permitted to lead prayer or <laughs> permitted to do anything even even though they they were considered fasics of the dean because they were outrightly yeah. doing you know music yeah they still were still singing about Allah and his messenger yeah. right, right. Allah, what was like they weren't singing about like you know like yeah. getting it down or whatever it might be well it's funny like... because uh in the past you had singers and you had storytellers mm. then islam came in okay now these singers and storytellers now had to adapt their trade, right? They had to adapt their lyrics. They had to uh, adapt their stories because the whole population is now entering Islam. Mm. So we, early, as early on as the time of Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, the qusa, the uh, qasas, they're called, the stories, qasas, plural, uh, were a problem. They were a problem because they need to keep an audience. Who knows what their previous you know, stories were? So imagine now you have a movie makers and now they need to you know, cater to a Muslim audience. So you're going to, the scholars always looked at them with suspicion and they actually loathed them. And Ibn Josie has a whole book on how the setup loathed these storytellers. They fabricated stuff. Because, yeah, they their, their job is to get an audience, not to transmit the deen, right? Mm-hmm. So they would take, now they got to tell stories of MBA and Sahaba. So, but now, because they're stuck with that now, right? But now they're fab- they're adding to it. They're giving details that don't exist. Blah blah blah. So they're all about we're at war with them. This is great because that's exactly how I feel about people who do like modern Islamic music. Yeah. Like they try to make pop music into Islamic <laughs> music, and they uh, <laughs> and the people that make like Islamic based like movies, yeah. like like they'll make a show and show the Sahaba, and they'll yeah. be like, and it's super popular. Yeah. And, that's the and that's the good stuff yeah some of it is even is a lot worse yeah so i can't stand it when you stepped out i was saying certain mediums we can't compete in at all yeah like the big screen i mean uh, you're not competing in that i still regret watching the message (laughs) that was a good movie Uh, yeah all right but forever for for the rest of my life i can't get anthony quinn out of my head whenever whenever somebody (laughs) says hamza you know which is terrible yeah Yeah. you know what's a drunk in a cafe (laughs) when i took an art history class i could never watch any movie that portrays muslims again because the art history is always all wrong right for example bidad that's not art history but it's also when in the message the way that bidad gives the adhan is like straight out of azhar of 1960 right there's guarantee it was not the way that they were given adhans right uh at that time also you watch any of these movies they film them all in morocco let's say kingdom of heaven for example right they film all these movies in morocco i'm looking I can't help but notice it's all Moroccan kids running around with the uh, hoods on their on their clothes, and all the palaces that they're sitting in are all Moroccan Andalusian style that didn't even exist yet. By the way, that style of Andalusian geometrics hadn't existed in the time of the Crusades, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so 
when you're when you study art history, you have a hard time following Hollywood because they they just take anything Islamic and throw it in, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, but there is this is a question I've always had, right? Like, for example, I have seen the Omar series and I do regret watching it because of <clears throat> certain images that probably will not ever leave my mind. Yeah. However, there is certain benefit in you know in indulging in that versus indulging in something haram right so for example it's a false dichotomy though no i would say remove sahaba why don't you make a movie on yusuf bin tashfin right mm -hmm. like there's not haram to do that there's not even a haraj in doing that right and not only that you can take some poetic license and, and add characters right, right. and stuff you right. could do that yusuf bin tashfin is the he was the um from the from one of the tribes of the sahara uh, that came up and, and ended up by fatwa from a mm -hmm. Tulsi and Ghazali to conquer Andalusia. Is that Al, Al uh No, Marabits. Al Marabits. Right. So by fatwa from a Ghazali and a Tulsi, that you must conquer Andalusia and anyone who comes in your way, Muslim or non, his blood is halal because the party kings, what they were called, uh -huh. the uh, the uh, uh, Taifa period. Yeah, Taifa period, or every Muslim is on his own, mm -hmm. right? They Every Muslim little city was on their own. Uh, it's a it's a risk to lose the land completely and to lose Islam in the in the area. Mm. So they uh, issued that fatwa for him, and he went up there and he did conquer right all of Andalusia. So you, you can make like a long series on Yusuf bin Tashfin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there's no haraj in that stuff. But <laughs> but I was gonna say, does it even have to be? I'm, l l ignore the 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 Omar series yeah. or the or the Muslim thing. But is there some good in? certain types of entertainment like that's I mean, that's what a lot of these muslim quote unquote you know directors and you know filmmakers and artists are all about nowadays right which yeah. is let us sort of infuse this halal uh you know islamic music or whatever it might be so that you know we can drive people somewhat towards the deen rather than have them listening to whatever pop music people listen to today I'm going to take uh, an unpopular position. I think you should admit that all of it is at the very best, Makro, at the very best. And admit that to yourself so that you have some hope of reducing it and maybe even eliminating it from your life rather than finding for yourself ways that, oh, it's not that bad. It's actually probably halal and it's better. And then, because then you're just going to engage in more of it. And you're not going to, you're not going to have any incentive to reduce it. I have an even more popular, in, uh, I have an even more unpopular opinion my thing is if you're gonna do something right why do it like halfway either listen to it properly or don't listen to it at all right why listen are we to back the... to, this is back to the was that in the Yusuf quote <laughs> oh yeah that we never finished and we, we will never finish yeah. Oh, yeah. we'll uh, finish it off the air uh, uh because it's like why it's like those people who have those like halal parties? What is that group called? <laughs> oh, the yeah, those halal those idiots party. in Chicago. What is that called? I don't know. It's like uh, it's like halal dance club or something. I don't <laughs> they, know what they they're calling themselves. So basically, they have like this halal sort of like club. So you you come in, it's guys and girls. They don't. Th there is intermixing, but there is no touching. There is fake Allegedly, booze or no whatever. Touching. There's there's like it's like virgin alcohol. I was like, you know, if you're gonna go halfway and do <laughs> no, this, this is... whack version of a party, <laughs> why even? This why not just go to a real club. You're this already... is exactly what I'm talking about, though, right? Like <laughs> these people are people who found excuses for this, 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 and they go, well, it's not as bad as doing the real thing, and now they have no incentive to walk away from it. Whereas if you admit that you're listening to music, you're hanging out with the opposite gender you're um, engaging in all this kind of activity, then you admit to yourself that you're doing it, but you probably shouldn't be, you know that you shouldn't be, you're eventually going to walk away from it. Instead, you have these adults, they're grown people acting like idiots, like 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 17 year olds that don't know any better because they've given themselves fatwas. It's, it's, uh, it reminds by, me. by the way, there's a principle that the ruhsa that you allow for today becomes the ruling for tomorrow. Of course. Right? Yeah. Now imagine if it's not even a ruhsa. Yeah. Imagine if it was like sort of haram, but we allowed it because there's a worse haram, right? Yeah. Then it becomes a halal in the future, right? I think so, you should just admit that it's that's it's not good. It's I, probably haram and walk away from it as much as you can. I totally agree. And my philosophy on these things is that I'm focusing, let's say if our goal is to survive, our keep our deen alive and pass it on, I'm going to isolate the two biggest issues, okay, and and focus on them. And that is 
atheism and anything that touches the family like sexual anything sexual lgbt any destruction of the family right because if you look at the quran allah always says you believe in allah and you'll be good to your parents right because that's and if you look at all throughout the quran is based on families ali imran right musa wa harun al musa wa al harun right yeah so all families right so the whole, that's the root of humanity right so i'm going to look at these two things i'm actually going to capitulate and i'm going to i'm going to admit that there's going to be hits on those on lesser things but i don't have time to look at them right you can't get distracted by 30 things you can't fight 10 battles at one time so fight only the fight the biggest two things okay focus on those two things if you can really truly isolate these things you'll survive this fitna that we're in mm-hmm. and i'm capitulate that yeah i can't look at i can't be bothered on a truckload of other issues which i know you're probably correct on but i just can't be bothered right i mean now. just for a list just to illustrate and this is an extreme example and i know that it's not what we're talking about but suppose that you're in a situation where you absolutely will not be praying dhuhr during the day you're just not going to do it because of your job because whatever your situation is you know you you don't give yourself a fatwa and say it's still the Rudi time i'll pray before asr goes out mm-hmm. and it's permissible for me to do that because eventually at some day you're going to have the opportunity to pray that dhuhr and you're not going to do it mm-hmm. as opposed to knowing that you can't miss dhuhr but you're missing it yeah. and praying it and making toba yeah mm-hmm. if you're gonna if the haram is happening in your life it's happening around you know no identify what it is and make toba because mm-hmm. if you don't if you find if you find some crazy fatwa somewhere that allows it you're not even going to ask Allah for forgiveness let me say something else too but you brought up an important point when it comes to leisure and entertainment everyone becomes a mufti mm. right yeah. and mm. all of a sudden the rules of ijtihad go out the window mm. so oh what does he say about this what does he say about this there's no he there's four sayings on anything right mm. okay there's four madhahib and unless you're a mujtahid don't go outside these the dominant opinion of the four madhabs because that is something we know is valid in the sight of Allah Ta'ala. It's not going to be sinful for you. But I read an article somewhere where Abdul Ghani and Ablusi allowed the listening to the gramophone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so everyone becomes a mufti on these matters, right? The safest way to live, period, is to go by the dominant. What do we mean by dominant? It means not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of fuqaha over time have a, come to this conclusion. And many mujtahids, outside the madhab and inside the madhab have come to these conclusions and this is what's safe if you're going to do something outside of it okay just say my nafs is just saying telling me to do it blah 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 don't go and dress it up with a fatwa mm-hmm. right i'm telling you we ended up in the early 2000s where the, ma- the, the things like maulid was looked down on all of a sudden you had full-blown orchestras in the early 2000s in yeah. the name of like Remember these awakening music. concerts, right? Yeah, Some yeah, of you yeah. saw all of them. Yeah. I'm looking. He started off with a voice CD. Yeah. Which was good. I listened to it, right? My my <laughs> people too. in my family would listen to it. Okay. Uh, next thing, next day, uh, two years later, it's a full blown orchestra. I remember Osama Cannon was like, he's seeing uncles, right? I was like, hold on a second. I was singing Qasida uh, Burda and you guys were yelling at me. And you're sitting in the audience with full blown mm. instrumental orchestra. How did that happen? When the Burda, exactly. you you wanted to cancel Burda night, Burda yeah. night, right? Yep. How did that happen? So, yeah. just as a quick reminder, stick to what's known. Don't change these things. But you're gonna know that, all right? Either you're weak on something, mm-hmm. just admit weakness, right? Rather than dressing it up with a fatwa. When in doubt, ask a Deobandi, a Salafi, or a, <laughs> or a Mauritanian. <laughs> it's over. It's over. <laughs> that, well, see, one of the things, and this might be a pretty controversial point, so. Dr. Shadi, please don't punch me. Okay. okay. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that sometimes fiqh gives a ruling that might not reflect the reality of how much, uh, a th- for example, uh, video games, right? There's there are certain video games, for example, FIFA, right? Is it halal or haram? It's obviously halal. There's nothing what do that you mean it's obviously halal. Meaning from the from the external, from the outside apparent you know okay. view of it it's halal it's just a, a game about you know playing soccer okay okay now let's say a kid is sitting in his bed uh, you know sitting in his bedroom and playing eight hours of fifa right a day right mm-hmm. and this game is addictive now can you say that this is haram what what fiqhi argument can you use to justify that it's haram it's, a, it's, it would, about, it's case specific it what if that kid is very sick and he's in, he's in remission he's recovering and that's he has to be in the bed anyway 
Well, the thing is, you have, what you have to understand is not the breakdown of life is not all in halal and haram. There's benefit right, exactly, and harm. Yeah, yeah. There's liked and disliked. There's be, mm-hmm. there's there's benefit and harm, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, waste of time is makruh mm-hmm. at the bare minimum, right? It becomes and like we said, the breakdown here Allahu is that which is done is playing done by an adult that when he should be doing something better for himself and it's madhmum. Like, is it? Uh, okay, the word haram it's sufficient that Allah used it with them right mm-hmm. them being blame Allah was used so many times in the Quran mm-hmm. right and it's always blamed right so yeah you, you look at in life there's not always everything is going to be put in halal and haram mm-hmm. but it is going to be put in you know there's benefit and harm I, I think we need to get away from this mindset that just because something isn't haram that I should do it yeah. You know, I think that's a very, and I've seen this a lot, you know, people watching shows, people watching this and that, but is it haram? Yeah. Is it clear cut haram? No, but, you know, look look at how it's affecting your life, yeah. you know? Oh, um, let's say somebody who can't even manage one wife wants to get married to four. Yeah. Oh, but is it haram? You know, it might be for you, <laughs> right? Yeah. But, but the, it doesn't have to be, by the way, a thing yeah. does not have to be haram, but its side effects can yeah. be blameworthy for you and maybe count against you in the akhirah. For right, example, exactly. someone who's playing FIFA for eight hours a day in his bed, is that is his moving his thumbs in haram? No. But his not fulfilling certain other duties in mm. life will cost him. Mm. Right? right? And and the, the dislike things are not always the harm of them, the consequences don't always show up in the akhirah. Sometimes it, it shows up here. Mm. So yeah, you won't get punished in the afterlife. But you're going to get punished here. By being a failure, by being miserable, that all your friends are going to medical school and graduate school and law school and blah 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 and having jobs and getting married and what are you doing? You're not right. Oh, yeah. What so, was the ruling on chess? Huh? What's the ruling on chess? Chess, the Madikis or Shafi's or everyone? Uh, generally. Generally. Disliked to prohibited, right? The the general is a negative, especially if it distracts from the prayer and the Madikiyah were very strict on it the chef a were a bit only limited that it doesn't distract you from the prayer if i remember if my memory serves correctly. so that applies to every let's you can analogize oh you're making an analogy yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and by the way that analogy everything will be less because chess it works the brain mm. okay and oh, the, one of the reasons the chef a yeah. i think ibn hajar asqalani wrote about it that it exercises muscles it exercises the brain mm. Whereas those things, I don't know if you can say they have anything near. Not most of them. I mean, if you right. if if you if I bring you a chess grass, grandmaster of chess and I bring you the latest 2018 FIFA champion video gamer, <laughs> right? Who are you more impressed with? Right. Right. Exactly. So uh, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So now I'm I'm gonna take it into a slightly different direction. Uh, there is some positive I found in certain types of entertainment, mm-hmm. especially modern entertainment. One thing. Because I feel like often there is no, you know, other, at least for, for people who are weak like myself. One thing I found is, for example, children's videos, right? I, you know, my, my daughter watches the, I think Ali Alibaba, he created like the Zucky for kids, right? It's like this like blue bear and he recites like. So Alif Ba? Yeah, he does all types of Alif Ba and Quran. And so stories. it's Adam's world, basically. It's, it's sort of like Adam's world. And, and I think it's created by Alibaba, the. Baba Ali. Baba Ali. Baba Ali. Baba Ali. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Baba Ali. Yeah. Okay. So they, they do like, um, you know, all types of different cartoons where they teach like children, like, you know, that like you should say salam when you enter and, you know, you should, you know, say bismillah before you eat. So it's like, it's like a children's cartoon where they teach like, you know, good manners and things like that. There, I found that there can be good in certain types of entertainment. And I think that's the intention where some of these like musicians and, I don't know about comedians, but musicians go go out uh, in in search of like creating like halal entertainment that is sort of similar to like what I'm describing with these children's cartoons, where it's like okay, it's providing good benefit. It's like you're, the kids are going to watch TV anyway, you know, a lot of them, right? You might as well give them something good to watch rather than you know something you know, if they're watching, I don't know. Paw Patrol or something. I, I think I, we have. Uh, sorry, sorry. I would just really quick two seconds. I would highly recommend anyone who's got little kids up to the age of twelve. What I advice that I got from our friend Dr. Arshad, he said, minimize it as much as you can. Absolutely. And if they're going to watch anything, enlarge the screen and put a distance, like mm-hmm. on the TV, 
better than a laptop, laptop better than an iPhone, because it's just better for their eyes and their brain. And I would limit it to such a degree. And this limitation has done so, it, it filled, the void is filled. For example, kids could love, re, they start to love reading because that's the only option they're given. Or they love each other, talking to each other, because that's the only option they're given. And kids can't be trusted to, to judge themselves or discipline themselves. So it should be kept to a little, a little bit. I know, I'm sure people are going to watch stuff, but it should be minimized to a, a certain hour of a day like one day a week or something like that i i, I will personally attest to, to this just because you know uh my, my daughter is you know she's around she's like a toddler now as yeah. we've tried from the very beginning i don't i think maybe one time she's ever watched anything on a laptop right yeah. phone is an absolute no tablet is an absolute no laptop is like pretty much no the only time she's ever seen it is if we're on it and doing something right. right uh and it's like even if you watch the tv it's at a distance and i've noticed her and around other toddlers right it's it, it's crazy the amount of one i feel like you know parents just hand phones to their kids and they're just like kind of like you know going off for like two hours on their own in the corner yeah, it's very bad it's 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 extreme i'll tell you the scary thing is that uh, no matter what you do as a parent and you do a great job here's the problem your kid's gonna have to marry some of those other kids that's the problem right yep. and so all your work is going to go down the toilet that's why the idea of Safina's society, right, is that this thing has to be done as a group. Mm -hmm. And when it has to be done as a group, you have to go to lower com lowest common denominators and you have to isolate the only the most important things because when you do something in mass, you can only focus on certain important things. Yeah. And this is one of them, right? The idea, the screen time is definitely one of them. Huge. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I was going to say uh, to Maureen's point earlier is this is important for us to be precise with our language. When you say musicians, if they're playing musical instruments and they have a band or whatever, they're, they're, that's out. Like, I don't care what your intention was. It's out. We have to admit that. I'm not saying nobody, nobody's going to listen to it. Muslims are 100% going to listen to it. They're listening to trap music, too. That's not the point. The point is you don't make excuses for it no matter what the intention. If you're talking about Yusuf Islam, old stuff, A is for Allah, perfectly fine. That's what it should be like. You want to add instrumentation? You think that it's going to sell better? Who sold them better than than, than those old Yusuf Islam tapes? Mm -hmm. Like nobody. Like this mm -hmm. stuff was huge, yeah. and n kids aren't different today. People are not different today. We're the same human beings, and it would work just as well if those were the only options presented. Mm -hmm. You should only give your own nafs that option, that option, and don't give your nafs what it's really asking you for. Discipline it before it disciplines you. Yeah, and and we should be suspicious of the give up attitude of people are going to do stuff anyway. If that implies, well, let's just cut corners in the dean, right? Because people are going to do stuff anyway. Because the next thing you know, your kids are dating. Yeah. Your, just, daughter, your daughter has five boyfriends. Yeah. Like, it's not good. It's yeah. something to note here. And I, I know you mentioned, Dr. Shai, that you don't, you don't know about the past. However, you know, I'm going to bring it up as a point because even recently within you know the non-muslim world i think the way that we consume entertainment has drastically changed mm -hmm. right in i'm not old enough to remember this but you know people talk about you know listening to boxing matches on the radio you know 30 mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. and people you know someone could sit down in their in their house by themselves listen to a boxing match on the radio and fully enjoy it mm -hmm. Yeah. You that could now you know you, baseball too. you can watch an MMA fight in 8K and it still ain't you know vivid enough. It's all subjective. Right? <laughs> all this stuff is subjective, right? It's all subjective of what you have, right? If they listen to a boxing match on the radio because you've never had anything like a radio before, it's a big deal. It's all subjective. I've right? listened to basketball games on the in the car, yeah. like driving and it's a playoff game. I've yeah. listened to to the game in the car, but but there's actually science behind this, and like I'm. I'm super against. I read this recent article that there should be legislation passed to ban technology for certain ages, right? Hundred percent. I'm nope. super super against this. Absolutely. Uh, sorry, not. I'm not against it. I'm for it. Right. Yeah. What is I'm for absolutely it. not. Absolutely, there should not be any legislation passed to ban anything. Well, uh, <laughs> okay. A hundred percent no. Let's uh, let's go away from the legal it? stuff. But I'm just making it's a, a point. Huge, this yeah, is yeah, an important yeah, point yeah. because. We're asking the government to intervene, which means right, what right. we're actually doing is we're turning over our parenting skills to them. Right, we're turning right. over our community responsibility mm -hmm. and in a way that's only going to be harmful because mm -hmm. once they get in, right. they're going to ask for more. They're going to impose more. Mm -hmm. And you're trusting them to enforce things on your children. Right. It's a huge yeah. mistake. Sorry, I'm, I couldn't uh, I couldn't let that. No, no, no. I'm trying. Uh, I'm going to get to that point, which is 
that uh, products actually change via demand, right? Not by laws from the government. Market but, forces. But market forces. But anyway, there's actually science behind this. And that is today's entertainment. The, the way that it's different from previous uh, eras is that top experts of human behavior, like people that study human behavior and psychology and how to basically hack the brain, these people are the people that are producing these things, right? And they're doing it precisely to hack the brain so that they keep your attention. And what that does is it absolutely messes up your reward circuitry in your brain. So you can't, you can't even, like I've seen kids, I, I teach Sunday school, I'm always around these little kids. The kids that play Fortnite, like I know from their parents, right? Because the dad's out at work like uh, for the whole day and uh, there's no control in the house. The kids that play Fortnite all day, I mean, they look as if like their souls are dead. I can see it in their eyes. Staying and, up late? Huh? Because of staying up late? Not because of staying up late, because of the extended uh, entertainment. Okay. Like uh, looking at a computer screen, uh, looking at this thing that's meant to get you addicted. Mm. It destroys your reward circuitry. Mm -hmm. And this is especially dangerous in kids. Mm -hmm. It will destroy mm -hmm. them forever. Like, so I totally forever. agree. The, so example, the, exa yeah. the game PUBG on mobile was banned, actually, in the state of Gujarat in India mm. because... Uh, some a number of kids. One kid like killed his dad because he wouldn't let him wow. play. Right? What? Yeah, there's kids. There's, like he, he just killed mm, his dad. There, like, you see these stories all the time. Yeah. Kids that stay up for hours mm. and hours and hours, pee on themselves what? rather than stop playing. It, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. I'll tell you why. If you're an adult, you have so when you're growing up, right? Um, the brain is actually small. It's not fully developed, and your experience around the world is what builds your brain up. So the reason why you should exclude kids from digital technologies mm -hmm. is they're actually interacting with the real world. And when they're interacting with the real world, they can't get the reward as immediately. Mm -hmm. So they need to actually build that willpower. So the, the part, their frontal lobe gets stronger and stronger, right? And then they're interacting with things, they're falling, they're experimenting. Mm -hmm. So they're becoming more self-aware of their existence, right? In a sense. When you just hand your iPad to the kid, the only thing that's developing is the reward circuitry. Mm -hmm. And that reward circuitry is saying, go for this thing, it makes you feel good, mm -hmm. and keep going for it at all costs. Like, that's, lab, like lab rats. Exactly, that's exactly what happens with addicts. Now, if you take your, the drug away from an addict, what is he gonna do? He's gonna kill for it. Mm -hmm. So it makes perfect sense that these kids are like, you know, ready to kill their parents because they have no, their developmental uh, process has been ruined. It's poison. Things. It's yeah. poison. Absolutely. The other thing that this does is, so kids need to, when they're developing, they need to interact with normal colors, not bright, mm -hmm. ultra bright colors. They need to mo interact with normal movement, not super fast cuts, st stuff that bright, bright, loud noises. And they also need to inter inter interact with a 3D world, not a flat 2D world. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're on the topic of kids, we should talk about fitness, how important and good for kids is to, to get sweaty. That's the other thing. Gamers are... Yeah, they're Their all health physically is really bad. Yeah. Let, let me give one one note here. The this is really crazy. So there's a guy named Near Al, Near El, right? He looks kind of like Voldemort. But uh, <laughs> he he wrote this book called Hooked, right? It's a very famous book uh, used by product designers and, and a bunch of folks uh, to to build like habit forming products. This same guy now has a book called Indistractable how to keep your attention in, <laughs> in, in a habit forming economy yeah. so he literally built the products to you know keep you addicted and then he he's now writing a book oh, so he probably knows better than anybody yeah. oh yeah but that's what he claims right he's yeah. like i built this stuff i know how to get you unhooked yeah. yeah right uh but it's all a money-making scheme like so don't so don't think like you know this, this is all you know in good fun like this is it's not good what these people are doing you know, you're talking about getting people addicted. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a way to make money, right? Yeah. You're doing it oh, for, of course. For, for profit. I yeah. think it's an important time to interject with the Hamza Yusuf 1990s reading list about oh, this yeah. subject. Totally. Shah Hamza was saying this in like 92, mm -hmm. which is Neil Postman, Gerrymander, uh, Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television, and Entertaining Ourselves to Death. Yeah. Those two books should be mandatory reading for any parent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to ruin your child's health and well-being after you after you know what you're doing, good. You're answerable on the day of judgment. Yeah. But at least inform yourself if you're going to be raising a, a one of one of Allah's creation. Mm -hmm. Part of fit is physical fitness. There's also social fitness. Mm -hmm. How many times have you had like a nine-year-old kid who like you meet their dad and then you look at them and you say, Assalamu alaikum, and they look at you like you're like, some kind of a monster mm -hmm. or he's like 11 years old so he's past the age of being scared and shy that a stranger's talking to him 
He doesn't even know how to talk. Those are the kids I deal with. <laughs> he doesn't even know how to say salam anymore. Like you ask him, hey, wh- what's your name, right? And he's like, there's no response. It's like someone dead. So this is socially unfit, right? Doesn't he needs to interact more, right? Or uh, if ever you had some an adult talking to you, to a kid and the kid looks away, like basic manners. And not even just looking away. I mean, I'm talking. Your same example can be applied to like I know seventeen year olds, eighteen year olds who can't mm-hmm. hold conversations with adults. Mm-hmm. And you know, you know exactly what I'm yeah. talking about, right? Yeah. Like you'll be in a family gathering. Yeah. Or something. Uh-huh. You have these eighteen year old like mm-hmm. dudes, and I mean, yeah. I, I, mean I used to be one of those people. Yeah. So, so, but it's sad, yeah. Yeah. right? Meanwhile, last week I was at your house and I didn't know if you were upstairs or downstairs. Yeah. So I saw your youngest walking by. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. yeah. And I said, is your dad here or is he, is he upstairs or downstairs? And she was like, I don't know. So then I said, what kind of spy are you? And she was like, I'm not a spire. And I was like, no, what kind of spy are you? She yeah. was like, I don't know. I'm going upstairs. And she oh. just went up the steps. <laughs> and this, how old is she? She is seven. Mashallah. Did she look at you and talk? Yeah. Okay. She looked okay. at me. She was like, I'm not a spire. And oh I said, my God. no, what kind of spy are you? I know yeah. that. I, and she was like, I don't know. I'm going upstairs. Oh my God. Like that's a normal kid reaction. <laughs> and you know, you know, one of she the. She just stare at me and go. Oh. Yeah, that's what they do. Bubba. But, uh, I'm, I'm telling you. Yeah. Th- they don't talk to grandparents, neighbors, uncles, aunts, strangers in the masjid. Right. Now, I'm not saying strangers like. In the if you're in the masjid and someone says salam to you, that's sort of a space where and you're standing with your dad, correct? And your dad's here or the other side of the room. This is a great place to learn how to talk to strangers, right? Your because dad is saying say salam alaikum. Exactly, because you know that there are, there are manners. There are strangers, but it's also a place that is safe because your parents are here or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. And uh, what I meant to say was that um, there's actually a reason why this is happening, right? And it's I don't know the solution to it. I mean, I've grown around, grown up around sort of these problems myself, which is that you have communities, people that are like cut off from like extended communities, right? There are certain Muslim communities where uh, the parents are working, you know, both of the parents are working till Maghrib Mm -hmm. or till late at night. The kids, I mean, they're at home and they got nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. They have TV. Now they can't even go outside and play with anybody because there's nobody else. Mm -hmm. There's nobody around. Mm-hmm. And you go to the masjid, the masjid is just filled with like sort of very old uncles and nobody comes, yeah. right? So the kid goes one time, he gets scared, he just never comes back. So in that situation, what you end up happening is most of these kids, the boys at least, they turn towards gaming, mm-hmm. right? So that's what I did when I was a kid, I turned towards gaming, right? Um, and what happened is they get like addicted to the stuff, mm-hmm. right? They'll, they'll play like eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, whatever. Uh, the girls, they'll be addicted to like Korean dramas and things like that. Watch that all day, right? And to Korean dramas? Yeah, that's the big thing. Apparently, now. it's very popular. Uh, yeah. Oh, really? This is, this is a very accurate, right? Yeah, 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 really? Yeah. Korean, yeah. Dramas. Korean dramas. Korean dramas, right? Okay. So, and they're sitting, so the, these kids are isolated because, and I can't blame the parents, right? How are you going to live if you don't work with some of these immigrant communities? So, this is why, and I don't know what the solution is. Right? It, it, I really don't know. It's a struggle that the city created, mm-hmm. industrialization created. Yeah. This is the first time we've been having human beings raised up by two other human beings, yeah, as opposed to seven, exactly. such as exactly. your grandma, and grandpa. That's four, right? Two grandmas, two grandpas, probably a half a dozen aunts and uncles, mm. right? Older cousins, older siblings. So that's why they said it takes a tribe or whatever it takes a city to raise a man, right? Yeah. Because everyone would, you would live and morals and manners were upheld by everyone around you. Mm-hmm. Now it's resting on two people, right? Exactly. And usually that's not enough. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work. I mean, I don't, I, I, to be honest, I think you should just not buy your kids those video games. Like don't buy them. This, this is expensive. If the kid has mm-hmm. enough money to buy it, he probably has a job yeah. and he's responsible. But if he can't afford it by himself, don't buy it for him. That's good. I'm just, just don't. To, to it doesn't get, matter if his friends played and he doesn't. Yeah. To get the, uh, to get this point across to my kids, one of the videos I show them like regularly every once in a while, mm. right, is the videos of parents breaking their kids' uh, phones and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Because if, right. when they have it in life, but I, want, that's going to happen eventually. But I want them to know what real life is like mm-hmm. first. Yeah. Like there's no point of reference anymore mm-hmm. for these kids. Yeah. Like I have a point of reference. If I ever go off on an excess in something Mm -hmm. i know it's an excess because i have a point of reference Mm -hmm. and i know that this doesn't feel good at all yeah right but how do a kid 
who's born with this stuff, raised with this stuff, yeah. has no point of reference. They don't. That's the thing. They haven't experienced real life. So yeah. what they do is they turn to these uh, fake lives, so to speak, to get some type of value, yeah. right? And it's really sad, and I don't know what the solution is, but I do know where it comes from, which is this, you know, well, one of the things organization. Is, one of the things is that people do live where they live and people live where they work, but it is incumbent upon Muslims to take on a little bit of an extra um, burden and make sure that you could live in a community, you yeah. know, like an area that has a lot of Muslims where you could make friends. You can go somewhere and see other regular Muslims mm -hmm. that hopefully there's a faqih there, there's yeah. a scholar there, yeah. right, that, that can give good lessons, right, for, for the community. And, then, and and you can ask them when mm -hmm. they have something. And the scholar leads and try to create activities. So, yeah, that might mean that you put that extra effort in. I mean, why would you live out in the middle of nowhere? What's the value? And probably someone will tell you, well, my mom lives here and she's sick. Mm -hmm. So he's stuck. It's right. true. That is a good, valid reason. But the real reality is that you should take her with you, mm. right? Because Allah says in the Quran, al-kibr." If they grow old with you, in other words, at yours, it really, indaka is not with you. It's at you or, mm. you know, at you meaning like at your house. Mm. So take them with you. But you really, it's. I can't imagine how you're going to go up you're you're going against your culture the the culture you're going against the probably the thing taught in school mm. you're going against so many things and you're all alone yeah. like you almost have no chance you could also just a strategy if your kid is alone at home for two to three hours before you get home and they're old enough and responsible enough to be alone and it's not a crime to leave them alone like it's not child endangerment mm -hmm. Assign them tasks that are going to keep them busy mm. for most of that time. Mm. Not homework. Don't make them do math. Right. But just something that they can do around the house that you know is going to keep them busy. And even if it's just busy work, like go outside and, you know, rake all the leaves mm. before I get home. Yeah. And, uh, you're just you know, going to have less of an opportunity yeah. and mm -hmm. punish yeah. them if they don't do it. Chores are very important. Yeah. Uh, mm. So the next uh, topic that, I don't know, not topic, but the way I want to go is one thing I've noticed is media today uh, has <laughs> sort of gone into not that it hasn't always been but it's sort of going towards displaying like moral depravity on screen yep right mm -hmm. and I find that because I mean we, we live in in today's day and time Muslims also become attached to this sort of media and, and, and a few examples that I can that I can come up with you know for example the Joker movie that just recently released Game of Thrones Breaking Bad uh, I, I mean I can just sit here and come up with a bunch of examples right but these are really they're considered art right mm -hmm. masterpieces of media and and they really depict moral depravity on mm -hmm. screen right yeah. uh, and and it's it's scary to think about because you know uh, what what would you say about muslims that you know are engaging in these things and and a lot of people do right it's not like you know, people don't so how do you understand these types of you know things mm -hmm. and and where would you you know what were your guys thoughts on it from a muslim perspective dr shani mm -hmm. it's, if i'm correct if something is haram to do it's haram to watch right it's true Mm. I mean, that's it that's the answer it's yeah. haram they shouldn't do it and if they do do it they should do it recognizing it's haram to do and so that they can inshallah make tawbah when they do it and know that they should stop and make a plan and maybe stop mm. and you know one of these things uh, that I've noticed is certain imams and even certain like people that are detached from this type of culture they want to just do it just so they can relate with people like you said Dr. Shadi what I've seen is actually so I haven't watched a TV show in like, you know, almost a year or something like that, right? And what I've noticed is I'm actually relating better with people, right? Whereas before I would watch TV series, whatever. And, you know, it doesn't actually help you relate better with people, I don't think. Because in regular conversation, that's not what people are usually talking about. It's usually a conversation starter, but it's not necessarily... You know, um, but yes, I do work at a. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, and that's why you know I'm depressed at my job. Well, the, the, the thing is that uh, my philosophy on these things is that, as I said before, there are a list of priorities, mm. right? And you cannot be distracted from these priorities. There are certain things that would be excellent to eliminate, but it's just not. It's definitely not my priority mm. in terms of uh, when I deal with people, right? So yeah, the, these types of things. 
uh, some are more fahish than others. Mm-hmm. Like Game of Thrones has like basically like complete nudity, right? That's more fahish than others. There's no discussion on that. There shouldn't even be uh, anyone going there uh, unless they're going to make a Christian version or something where they, you know, clip it out. Mm-hmm. But I've always thought about the guy who's doing the clipping, right? <laughs> so, you, know, you, know, you know what's crazy? He's doing it for the sake of the community. You, yeah. you know what's crazy? At NBC, right? At yeah. NBC, uh, when I used to work there, the, there was this one girl who was uh, tasked with coming up with an algorithm to right. detect nudity, right? Yeah. So, um, so her job is literally to tune this algorithm to detect nudity. So she would run like a R-rated film through this algorithm and then she would check the uh, nude scenes to see that oh it actually did detect it and I'm sitting there in a presentation where she's presenting this <laughs> she's like as you can see it works <laughs> she goes to like a nude scene and you know they're like adults in the room everybody and we're just like staring at the screen right and then nobody utters a word I'm just like what kind of you know what I mean like how can you justify you spending eight hours a day doing that in uh, <laughs> in ten speakers. years, in ten years, there's not even going to be a feeling of awkwardness in the room because yeah. all the kids in those room, all the people in those rooms, have been raised basically on pornography, mm. and the people who are making our local laws are going to be those types of people. So yeah. we should expect all that stuff to become completely normal. It's going to be um, normal on broadcast television. Well, yeah. there's not even going to be broadcast television. I mean, why? Yeah. I That's true. That. <laughs> I mean, because you know, Nazma and I work in a similar industry. I know the same thing you know i've experienced things like this especially when it comes to adult content within uh you know comcast or verizon or your your broadcast network is you know when i go to work people will talk about like oh you know we need to take this out i don't want people to see my adult content and it's like <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what you know what else is like that <laughs> what do you what do you mean like it's it's like openly admitting you know it's like yeah you know i have adult content other people have adult content and we have it there and we don't want people to see it and i'm like <laughs> you mean the company does or the individual these are individual i mean we're just talking on teams right and people are talking about their personal accounts or whatever they have and so i know Wait, like they have adult content like on their instagram or something no no no, 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 this, no, no. Is, this is personal this is, yeah. you know the their, their tv streaming so okay pay-per-view channels or things they purchase <laughs> <laughs> what the hell man wait 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 I, I'll tell you <laughs> off-air stories. No, well, I'm good. <laughs> you, you know what else? You know what else has become a complete norm is uh, people talking openly about their therapist, seeing their therapist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whereas I remember growing up, that idea was like, wow. How dare you, oh shame me? <laughs> <laughs> How dare you stigmatize? Oh my gosh. Yeah. But um, yeah. So I mean, I think we're we're getting to a close here. So uh, yeah. So just to give a quick summary of the whole thing, um, I'm just going to give my quick summary. Musamara is something that should happen. Uh, physical activity is really one of the best things. Uh, screen activities and pop culture. I have my, my two main positions on it is that on one hand, I don't overthink it. On the other hand, I minimize, minimize, uh, minimize it as much as possible. Right. So those are my two things. You heard some more ideas from Alex and Mo- uh, Naz about the, you know, a little bit more thought into the actual nature of different entertainments. Right. Uh, and I think it ends up being a wash anyway, because I don't necessarily look at the as long as it's had out. I don't really look at the go deep into the thing. But I do think it should all be minimized. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going to get into something, get into physical fitness. At least it's something that's, you know, really good for your body. You get sweated out. Right. And, and get physically fit. Uh, Alex mentioned some things that are more handy. Right. Uh, and then archery and, and 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 having a gun. And uh, you said something else. Uh, uh, look, shooting, shooting, or, yeah, yeah, shooting. You didn't, yeah, not archery. Right. Have, sh- knowing how to get around. So for kids, hunting. bikes for adults, for grown, for like teenagers, learning how to drive well. Yeah. Hunting, you said hunting, too. Yeah. So all those types of things are all uh, things out there that are options for people to take. But the for the family, there should be musamara. For the family, uh, you Maureen brought up. What about the the uh, in the past? What did they do or not do? I'll tell you one thing. They do. There was no such thing as take a vacation. <laughs> right, <laughs> I, I say this all the time, and people get mad at me. Yeah, I'm like you know, people didn't take vacation. Yeah, Sheikh, uh, I was talking with someone, one of my colleagues, and he said, "Our teachers, we have to realize they didn't take vacations. We took vacations, right? Like we actually take a vacation, but they have no such thing as a vacation. So does that mean that they? Uh, it's a, it was a different world, though. At the same time, we have to realize that, right? Yeah. It was a different world. You could you or you take your family and go to another city. Maybe two hundred years ago, there weren't hotels." You can only go to a city where you knew people, 
Right. There were hotels, but you know what the hotel was? It was on the highway for the merchants to yeah. stop, right? They, that's the funduk in the past yeah. was for the merchants to stop or whoever. There's no such thing as taking a vacation. Let's go take a family vacation to Damascus. <laughs> it was <laughs> to get killed on the way. If you no, if you knew, uh, uh, if you knew, what things were. <laughs> I mean, it's not just that you show up. In, you show up. So you show up in Damascus, and what do you do? Yeah, <laughs> you don't know anyone. No exactly. one knows you. They're gonna look at you like you what don't are have you doing Google here? Maps, right? And you have Air, nowhere to stay. Airbnb. Eve, e, first of all. You only went there if you knew someone. Secondly, yeah. the homes were not so big to, to host everyone yeah. in the homes. Right. So there, there could you could read that someone was sent to go visit his uncle and stay for the summer there from Damascus for a reason. But now, okay, the world has changed, etc. And there are vacations now, right? But all of this stuff, if you couch it in a life of habits, good habits, mm. such as reading Quran together, okay, uh, reciting awrad together. So in the car word of the evening right that part of life uh when there's a break review your recitation so you have a child okay recite for me such and such you have two children recite it together because it's easier to rec- two kids to recite from memory together that's when you want it you want them to review but not be really hard on them re- recite it together so one will pick up the other um in other words in the same voice as you see many of the quran schools they recite mm-hmm. in the same in one voice yeah. right the, everyone with the surah so uh, you do those things where you can couch your entertainment and whatever it is, as long as it's halal, in a way that neutralizes itself, mm-hmm. right? Just the fact that you're together as a family neutralizes itself, right? It neutralizes a lot of things. Uh, doing your deen and your awrad is going to neutralize things. So that's how I look at it. And I think it is a very important thing because the type of things that people consume, it could really, you know, put a hole in your heart. And at the same time, the opposite extreme. I'm not. I'm not really worried about people going to the opposite extreme right. of having uh, no entertainment. No entertainment just <laughs> being, 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 right? Who, who's going to that extreme? If no one. Uh huh. If only. Yeah. yeah. If that was our problem, that would be good. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and one of the things I wanted to say about taking things into the heart, uh, the realization for me uh, was when I realized that human beings are malleable. Right. They're subject to change. So I think most people don't realize that. Because then we now have a better definition of what we can consider beneficial entertainment or beneficial art. Anything that encourages those aspects of me that are negative, right? Or gives me reason for self-pity. Why would I engage in that, right? So, for example, The Joker. One of the things that's absent from that movie is redemption. There's no redemption, right? Just complete, like, going down a spiral and then that's it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's... It's a plane going down and just crashing. That's it. That's the end of the movie. Yeah. Now, why would you spend, like, is that the type of life that you want to live? I don't think anybody wants to live that type of life, right? Nobody wants to wallow in their own self-pity. So art, beneficial art or beneficial entertainment to me are those things that encourage the best in us, Mm -hmm. right? And for a long time, that was the entertainment, right? For a long time, the poems that people used to recite, the plays, Shakespeare's plays, right? Always there's a redemption. Mm-hmm. There's a type of redemption or a type of lesson, right? Uh, I know yeah, what you're going to say, Romeo. Except for the tragedy. Except for the tragedy. I mean, for the tragedy no, no. Even yeah. in the tragedy, there's a lesson, right? Even no, there's the a lesson, but it's not redemptive. Sure. Right. Like there's a lesson in the right, Joker. Right, right. Like, don't mistreat mentally ill people that are on the margins. Right. But uh, you don't, for example, someone watching Hamlet is not going to say, oh, I really resonate with that guy. Now let me go kill myself. Right, Why did nobody, he kill himself. Nobody killed a bunch of other people. Right, right. <laughs> but but the the point is that art that encourages those things that are good in me, right, and encourages me to better myself. I think that that's that's how we should you know view art, and we should promote those things at, at the expense of other stuff. I right? think uh, this will, that's a really good comment for art producers. Mm-hmm. Like if there's a Muslim producer of something, right, that's something that he could think about. Yeah. But I'll tell you why it changed is because art is all about change it's all about something new right Mm. the old is not something you know that's gonna make a draw right or move the needle it's also about challenging norms right yeah it's about challenging norms that's a western conception of art no but if you think about it it's always about change and Mm. pushing the envelope even like let's say in the islamic tradition you want to take a basic look at the islamic tradition what did they start with they went into these byzantine churches Mm. and those were the artists at the time and they said okay well we're going to make this a masjid we can't have any of those human beings that they would have like in the church adam and eve right yeah. and but keep the foliage 
That's how it started. You know that that's how it started in Damascus. Damascus. Yeah. They literally started that. They went in. They said, "This is really beautiful, but that's haram. That's haram. Keep the leaves." Yeah. Right. Well, the leaves, the foliage, became more and more abstract until it became like in the Ottoman foliage. It, it's clearly like leaves and tulips, but it's not meant to be a garden. Right. Mm -hmm. Then it went be to become uh, completely geometric lines yeah, right. and stuff. Right. So, in the Western tradition. You have the good guy story, the good guy and bad guy. Well, how long are you going to have good guy and bad guy, right? So someone finally said, all right, let's just make a movie about bad guys, right? right. And origin stories of bad guys, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, or a good guy who you don't really know if he's really that good, the right? Gray, the, gray, mm -hmm. the gray. Yeah, the gray. So, and it's not a, that the gray or the anti-hero or the bad guy origin story is anything other than it's new. Mm -hmm. And in 20 years, someone will make an origin story of like uh, some other bad guy. And I'll be like, oh, are you serious? Come on, this is just an iteration, right? And that's how they talk because they want something new. So There's always going to be something new. Something new. So yeah, that's sure. really what it is, mm. you know. But, but if it's newness, you know, pursuing the good, I mean, you no. said you're not khairat, no problem with that, you know? Yeah, be, but, oh. but you're, we're dealing with a tradition and a people who don't have any framework like this. So right. newness becomes, becomes the sacred cow, right? right? Whereas yeah. for us, that's why I said certain things like the big screen, a Muslim can never compete, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll never compete because we do have idea of redemption and good and, mm -hmm. and the idea that everything we do, if you're going to produce something, it should bring the best out of someone like right. what you just said, right? right. right? Exactly. So uh, certain mediums are impossible for us to compete in. So mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, that pretty much wraps it up in terms of this episode. But uh, uh, last time I kind of left it open. If you guys want to go on any tangents or any other topics, you're welcome to, <laughs> to do that at the end yeah. of the episode. <laughs> La, la, final word is, uh, you know, on days off, weekends or whatever, take your take your family out to some place in nature, like mm. hiking in the woods or something. Hiking is a great activity. It's, yeah. it's one of the right. absolute best. It's right. one of the best things, and it's one of the things that we're lucky to have in America. Mm. An amp, ample yeah. uh, amount of just don't hike uh, in New Jersey. It's probably not. Oh, I we mean, have we have great places, man. What are you talking? We I'm, have I'm Lyme afraid disease. of the Lyme disease. Lyme disease. Lyme disease. By the way, I didn't know that. Just. Oh yeah, Lyme disease is my, it's it's really big. In, oh, it's my, my sister had Lyme disease. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> but that I never crossed my mind. It would be a reason not to leave the just, house. <laughs> you just have to. You just have to tuck your tuck your your pants into your socks, wear boots, spray yourself mm -hmm. with D, and you're fine. Yeah. Just no. don't walk around with your legs exposed. Hey, in the, the, woods. Uh, the best thing go out uh, with either some 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 patties or whatever food. And go to those parks that have a grill in it, right? You go, you walk, then you go back to the car, get the um, the cooler, and grill. And you only have a couple weeks to do it anyway. It's going to be winter soon. Yeah. But this is really one of the best things that we have. And uh, funny thing is, when New in New Jersey, when you go to these places, you're in the mountain, but you can hear the highway. <laughs> <laughs> Massachusetts had some beautiful places. New England, yeah. which I, I New England to me is a really lonely place. It's like so much, the population density is so low. Right, you feel like almost depressed just being in New yeah. England, but the fall uh, walks it's there beautiful. and the hikes yeah. there are amazing. Right? Yeah, so get out into nature and yeah. go down to the beach, but not like during peak season. Yeah, you know, spelled both ways. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> go, 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 go to the beach when it's the off hours. Like yeah. me and my wife like to go like right before sundown. Yeah, and uh, you know everybody's gone. Uh -huh. and it's nice and you just sit on the beach at night it's yeah. very it's yeah. very it's very relaxing and beautiful uh and a totally off topic point but um so uh i was reading the history of prostitution uh before i came to it has been another <laughs> episode of the safina society there's, podcast. A Roman, there's a, one quote one quote that i want to mention um i don't know how i got into it i think uh, we'll maybe it's up. your colleague with the new <laughs> no, films <laughs> no, 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 no. but uh one of the things uh, in rome one of the things that happened is when they started out they were actually very conservative right the, Who, romans, the prostitutes no 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 the romans <laughs> the romans the romans were very celibate it was actually illegal like uh, you would actually have your rights taken away if you weren't married by 25 wow right so a bachelor, <laughs> we should enact that <laughs> <laughs> right so uh, they were a very disciplined culture very you know they conquered the world what ha ended up happening is when they conquered um asian countries uh, then their culture of luxury started invading rome and uh, roman famous roman senators people like cato the elder they were decrying they were like so sad that you know roman society is going to the dogs you know mm -hmm. prostitutes are becoming rampant people are indecent and 
what's interesting is uh, the, when Rome starts conquering Asian places, that's when the decline starts happening. Mm -hmm. Like when they start indulging in that luxury. You're talking about Persians so, or? Uh, or? Persians, okay. Syrians, whatever. So it's like, it's almost like, a, it's almost like a common theme in history when an entire society just sort of like loses its mind uh, into too much, entertainment. Too much wealth. Similar, then, thing, similar thing happened in the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman right? Empire yeah. too. Yeah. And, and the society declines. So, but wait, yeah. pre, pre this downturn, mm -hmm. did they still have like open homosexuality? Were they still uh, polytheists? They were, they were. All right, so whatever. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like this is like they added one aspect to their already decadent, horrible society uh, where they worship like fake gods and they engage in sex with young boys. Uh, uh, but it wasn't. Oh, I but mean, now they hire not women. all of them. Not all of them worship <laughs> fake gods. I mean, the Romans were famous for Stoics, right? Yeah. And if you actually look at Stoic philosophy, it's like you know, it's they like were a different type of kufar. Yes. Well, I, they didn't have prophets, so give them some credit. What do you mean? They didn't have prophets. <laughs> 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 okay. But every yeah. qawm had a prophet. Every though. single one. Uh, meaning like uh, the recorded the, ones that they didn't like yeah. murder okay but maybe yeah. maybe their prophet uh, they distorted islam and made it into stoicism we don't know well i'm sure that they did distort whatever yeah. if if they had a prophet at that time yeah. surely they did distort or they rejected him now, i'm about not to justify hinduism I'm, I'm well not, they didn't have a prophet that we know of no 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 i'm not <laughs> defending romans i'm not but i am impressed in certain aspects of them right yeah, like yeah sure uh if i'm going to be impressed with any people i like the spartans spartans i like so. their their the toughness mm. their um you know no indulgences mm. simplicity of life i'm telling you that's the right way to live man mm. Is to, to indulgence keep it to a minimum. You can have indulgences. Everyone's going to have indulgence. What is yeah. an indulgence? To me, it's like a steak dinner. That mm -hmm. to me is an indulgence, right? But keep your indulgences slowly, decrease them down to the to the you know to mm -hmm. to where it's so minimal that you're healthy at all times. Not just physically healthy the, for your spirit, your character, right? Uh, keep things disciplined. This is the best way to live. But I'm not for doing it in a manner that's miserable. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not into being miserable. Right. I'm not a fan of being miserable. I just got to be slow, mm -hmm. right? Slowly. But that's the direction that I we mean, should go there's to. There's two ways to approach Allah. Hmm. There's self-abnegation, yeah. where you just continue to deprive the nafs until it becomes obedient. Mm -hmm. And the other one is indulging in the halal until you become full of shuk. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. both work. Yeah, they both work. Interesting. And everyone's going to have a little bit of a balance of both. Though. Right. Yeah. And, and for the long term, discipline, right? empty the stomach as much as possible in other words like eating habits should be you know curtailed mm. these are just important uh, all that stuff yeah. Abdul Hakim Murad translated that, that portion of Ihiyad mm. um disciplining the two the two, two desires yeah. Yeah. it's really good it's really important really yeah. important maybe we should have an episode of discipline right because some people today think that CEOs that work like 600 hours a week that's uh, no yeah they think that's discipline like that sort of abnormal sort of um drive uh, drive right so, hustle, well, hustle, yeah. culture. hustle culture right hustle well culture. my, my I mean, those guys are taking tons of drugs too yeah, yeah, yeah. my view okay. of it is that uh many people are afraid of discipline because we all have habits and we don't want to change our habits right mm. but the right way to view it is that you literally just make us very subtle changes that's it mm. that you're you're you don't re really react to right mm. really slowly and then you regress a little bit. Then you take three steps forward again. Then you, then you regress half a step back. Mm. Then you take four steps forward. But it happens sure. so slowly, right, that uh, it, you're not miserable mm. by doing it. And if you ever achieve it, it doesn't lead you to kibber because you don't even notice that you made a change. Right. The big change, when it happens, you don't even notice. That's because fast changes in the good are really mm. bad. They're really bad for people yeah. because they lead to kibber. By the way, I think that we can do that episode right now in 10 seconds, which is find the uh, Raju Saleh in mm -hmm. your area that you can uh, study with, learn mm -hmm. from, emulate. And if not, then connect with someone at a distance, but find a righteous sheikh. And that's the only way that it works. You can't do it any other way. Yeah, uh, that, that's what worked for me. <laughs> you cannot do it yeah. online. You right. cannot do it from a podcast. You have to find someone that you can actually speak to, that you can write mm -hmm. letters to if you need to, if they're mm -hmm. far away. But it has to be like an actual real relationship. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's where you're talking spiritual discipline. Yeah. Spiritual yeah, yeah, advancement. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Spiritual advancement also bleeds into like real life. Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, obviously. Yeah. So I think we'll we'll wrap up since it's getting late. So, uh, Jazakumullah Khairan. I'll make uh, one small point. Um, 
if you ever i mean if, i don't think we've mentioned this in in almost a season but if anybody ever has a question concern you know feel please feel free to email us at podcast at safina society.org uh we also have a patreon account uh it's patreon.com slash ss podcast if you'd like to support our efforts we uh, you know do have a research team we've provided some books we've recently gotten some new equipment and we continue to you know further along some of our efforts so inshallah if you would like to support us it's patreon.com slash ss podcast so uh, Subha- uh that's it jazakallah khair and subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiru kuna tubu ilayk wa al-asr inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu amin al-salahat wa tawasubu al-haq wa tawasubu al-sabr wa salamu alaykum